started. Right. Um, formally welcome everybody to the uh, 34th meeting this year of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Switch off all electronic devices that uh, could interfere with the sound system, phones, etc. Um, we have apologies from Claudia Beamish and we welcome Claire Baker, who is attending as a substitute. And welcome everybody. Agenda item one is subordinate legislation. First item today is for the committee to consider a negative instrument, the Marine Licensing Pre-Application Consultation Scotland Regulations 2013 SSI 2013-286. Members should note that no motion to annul has been received in relation to this instrument and I refer members to the paper. Is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? We are agreed. Thank you very much. We can move on to uh, uh, agenda item two on deer management. In our second item today, the committee will continue to take evidence on deer management in Scotland and we welcome our witnesses. Robbie Kernaghan, uh, Unit Manager of uh, Wildlife Operations in SNH. Uh, Simon Hodge, uh, the Chief Executive of Forest Enterprise Scotland. Um, Will Boyd Wallace, Head of Land Management and Conservation, Cairngorm National Park Authority, and uh, Dr John Milne, the former Chair of the Deer Commission. Now, I refer members to the papers that you have, and we will uh, kick off with the first question. Can the members of the panel uh, provide evidence and examples to illustrate the impact that deer and current deer management practices are having on the Scottish Government's economic, social and environmental policy and targets. So, illustrate the impact of deer and current deer management practices on economy, society and environment. Who wants to kick off? Yeah, I'm happy to have a go first, yep. uh, Rob, so thank you for the question. I think it's quite useful for us to be talking about deer management again um, post Wayne, uh, whilst the Wayne Bill was going through the parliamentary process. I don't think deer were necessarily giving, given as good an airing as they may have done, so welcome the opportunity to discuss it with you all today. I think, first and foremost, I think it's important to recognise the importance within which we place deer in Scotland. They are an iconic species. We do value them for a, a whole host of reasons, uh, both socially and culturally. We recognise them as an important symbol of of Scotland and, and uh, a huge um, benefit both in terms of tourism and sport and biodiversity. Um, but at the same time, I think we recognise they also have the potential to impact adversely on a number of um, things in Scotland, agricultural production, um, biodiversity certainly at the wrong density, um, impacting on forestry production and some of our aspirations to grow more trees, uh, and indeed potentially public safety with uh, an increased interaction between people and deer, certainly on the roads throughout the country. Uh, we are concerned uh, increasingly about the, the frequency within which we're seeing deer uh, collide with vehicles. So all of these things, I think, show the importance of deer in Scotland and also the positive, but also the negative aspects that they can, they can impact on, on some of our aspirations. Simon? Yes. Uh, I, I could suggest the National Forest Estate as a, as a major example of... Um, <coughs> The importance of deer management practices, um, the estate uh, owned by Scottish ministers stretches over 650,000 hectares across Scotland. Um, echoing Robbie's points really, deer are a, a, a key species within managing uh, those living ecosystems across the National Forest Estate and um, we see deer management, uh, sustainable deer management as absolutely central to delivering a whole range of benefits from the estate. I mean, in terms of the economy, um, deer themselves are an important economic asset, of course, in terms of stalking and venison contributions to the rural economy, but also looking at the impact of deer on uh, forestry activities um, worth uh, in the region of uh, 460 million uh, a year to the Scottish economy. Um, and keeping that in balance with, as you mentioned, the social and environmental aspects of deer management. Um, just to touch on several points there in terms of um, the social 
uh, impacts. Deer are, are a, a really important species in terms of visitors to forests, visitors to the estate, and, and that, that visitor experience, wildlife viewing experience. Um, and also environmentally, deer are ecologically a keystone species. They have uh, a major impact on um, the structure uh, of uh, the environment and biodiversity. And managing deer population on the estate are one of the key tools that we use uh, to deliver other biodiversity ends, for example, expansion of native woodlands, management of key species like black grouse and capercaillie. Well, Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I won't repeat what other, others have said. So, uh, but in the national park in the Cairngorms, obviously the Cairngorms National Park is one of our, our most treasured landscapes, and within it we've got huge areas of designations. About 50% of the national park is designated for its natural heritage value, and um, so obviously the natural heritage is hugely important. And deer uh, obviously have positive and ne negative impacts, as has been said. And, um, there, there are potential impacts in, in a number of areas on, on, for example, our Caledonian pine forest and a lot of our upland habitats in the, in the national park, peatlands, for example, are being scrutinised very carefully at the moment because it's thought that deer are having a negative impact on those. Um, and a huge amount has been done over the last 10 years or so in the national park to try and uh, curb deer populations where they are having a neg negative impact. And we've seen some very, very positive results in a number of areas where deer culls have resulted in very good natural regeneration of woodland, both within fences but also out with fences where deer culls have been um, uh, quite heavy uh, and also controversial, as I'm sure you're aware in some places. And that has, but that has, has uh, proved very beneficial to the habitats in those areas. So I think there's been quite a lot of short-term pain in those areas for neighbouring interests and things. But... Um, I think in the long term, the, the, the habitats of those, those designated areas are improving. There are still some, some pressure points, as my uh, submission outlined, uh, and still some issues there. But you know, I would emphasise how important deer are to the local economy in the National Park. It employs a, huge, a large number of stalkers. Uh, and also the tourism side, it's very important as well. Um, we have a lot of areas where deer are deemed to be an attraction, a local attraction. People actually come to the area in order to see deer as well. So it's very important that we balance that in, in our thinking and in, in how deer are managed. And I'll just, just add very quickly that the, in the National Park, we're lucky that we have the Cairngorms Deer Advisory Group, which brings together the wider interests on deer management. So it's deer management groups and, and Scottish Environment Link and a whole range of uh, land ownership uh, interests as well. Um, and community interests. So we brought those people together to try and get a shared vision for the National Park. And, and we are getting there in the National Park. So things are, are quite positive there. So I think that's all I'd like to say at this stage. Uh, I just may make a few, a few minor comments. First of all, that I mean, deer are very important in, in terms of achieving um, Scottish Government objectives. Uh, in the last um, annual report of the Deer Commission, we, we highlighted the uh, how deer contributed towards a greener Scotland, to a wealthier and fairer Scotland, to a healthier Scotland, to a safer and stronger Scotland, and to a smarter Scotland. And deer and its, and its management are, are key in all of those areas. And the, the, the trick is trying to find the balance um, between, between these different objectives. And, and much of the conflict is about trying to achieve that balance. I put it to you, gentlemen, that uh, an SNH's study in 2010 um, on the economic value of activity in the countryside, that um, field sport tourism was worth about a tenth, 136 million, out of the total wildlife tourism, 127 million, walking tourism, 533 million, adventure activities tourism, 178 million, landscapes and scenery tourism, 240 million uh, in their estimates. So we put in perspective the question of uh, deer shooting in that. Uh, does, do any of you have any comments about that? Especially because, if I can come to Simon first, you mentioned the value of forestry, I think, is 460 million. Did I get it correctly? That's for forestry, not for dealing with deer mm. in forestry. Mm. Yeah, OK. Yeah. So what do you make of these figures from uh, SNH's study? I think from, from my perspective, um, recognising that there's a whole uh, host of benefits 
from people accessing Scotland's hills. Uh, some of that can be quite narrow in the fact that some of those economic benefits might actually be solely related to sports stocking, those clients coming in with guests uh, and, and spending money in a lodge. But at the same time, it's sometimes quite difficult to completely separate out the, the benefit which people come just to take recreation and access and, and, and all of the, the social benefits that people associate with taking access to the hills and seeing wild deer and seeing all of these species which are managed uh, uh, and trying to unpick all of those, uh, Rob, I think is quite difficult. But I do take the point that um, some of those studies just look at sports stocking in a very niche and, and narrow way. Uh, I think what we would say is that um, sports stocking is just one of the, the mainstays of the rural economy. There's lots of other benefit, uh, economic benefits for, which are brought. Simon? Just to add uh, a thought to, to the data, which... Um, uh, I've not got a comment on, but the thought is that uh, one of the issues often with these activities is who, uh, wh where the economic benefits um, uh, go within the rural economy. Um, and um, there is, I would imagine, quite a distinction between the stalking situation where the landowner uh, is actually securing uh, the benefit uh, of the stalking activity with the wider benefits of, of deer in, in the rural economy in terms of ecotourism, wildlife watching, where the benefits often uh, accrue to uh, other businesses not necessarily directly associated with, with the estate. I, I, think, I think it's very useful to have that context. I think it's always, uh, we have to be very careful with statistics as, as ever, but I think it's useful to have that context. And I think as Robbie said quite clearly, I think um, within the National Park, there's, there's all those ranges of uh, economic benefits through deer, through sports talking, through um, also, you know, wildlife tourism, etc. And um, I think it, the sports stalking side is one of many that we see as being very important in the national park. But I think in today's day and age, and being a national park as well, uh, sports stalking in some areas may need to adapt somewhat in order to fulfil wider objectives as well. And in many places, that is already happening. I mean, a lot of a lot of these um, um, statements about uh, the value. Uh, relate to things like landscapes, which are, are actually managed by my man and are managed in relation to deer. So that uh, I think you, one of the arguments for um, for considering, you know, not considering deer on its own, but is to consider deer in relation to the whole um, ru rural economy. And uh, if you do that, then it, it's obviously just a one small, relatively small component. And one's got to accept that. Indeed. Thank you. Um, no further supplementaries on that question. Um, Nigel Don. Thank you very much, Good morning. Good morning, Good morning gentlemen. Um, I'm very much hoping that you read and or heard what we did last week, because I really, really don't want to repeat everything. <laughs> you know, that doesn't help anybody. Um, you will therefore not be surprised that I'd like to pick up on the numbers. I'm hoping that if anybody wishes to comment on the model that I produced last week, that they will do so. But for this point, can I just ask about the numbers of the different species of deer? I appreciate that they're spread and I appreciate there are all sorts of other factors. Are we able to agree on what the total number of the different species of deer are in Scotland, please? Does anybody feel they can answer that one? Um, well, I think I did listen to the discussion last week and uh, I think, just so we're clear, we at SNH remain quite strongly of the view that talking about national deer population statistics is not helpful. <laughs> Primarily because of the inaccuracy of the data, actually. Uh, but also firmly of the view that what's more important is understanding the impacts those deer are having. Um, impacts on the ground are a much more direct and more reliable measure in determining how current deer densities are affecting vegetation-specific land use objectives. Um, although deer managers do rely, obviously, still on counts to inform management decisions, uh, we regularly provide those figures. And again, again, I've provided some of those in, in some of the, the information you have in front of you. Um, but in recent years, we've moved away from advising on management purely based on numbers um, towards management and measurement of deer impacts. Having said all that, it's impossible to get away from the discussion. Um, over the last five years, we've counted over two and a half million hectares of open hill and over 350,000 red deer, uh, primarily uh, to inform local deer management, not an attempt at national census, because again, it's really about understanding what's happening locally to inform, inform local decisions. And in doing so, I think we're always conscious of the, the need to make sure deer management is based on good data. Uh, we do need it, um, but we, we also know that it costs quite a lot of money, so conscious of the financial implications of, 
and certain reductions in our spend and ability to spend, um, obviously looking at a reasonable balance of cost and benefit in, in doing so. Um, and it's inevitable we will target our resources into those areas where there are problems. Um, that's what we're tasked to do. But if I was going to get drawn into debate about numbers, and I think I probably am, uh, how, how many should there be? I, I think last week you talked specifically about Red Deer, uh, and you touched on two scenarios, I think. One is, what is the current market demand for sports stocking? Um, and how many deer do you need to satisfy that? Uh, and I think, Nigel, you had a, a fairly good go at it, trying to articulate that. Um, we know that, on average, there are 60,000 red deer culled in the country. Um, 25,000 of those are stags. Of those, 10,000 are shot to protect agriculture and forestry. Um, therefore, you might argue the rest could be construed as the current sporting harvest. Um, and in order to satisfy that current demand to sustainably produce 15,000 red deer stags, your population might need to be in the order of 112,000 stags, 112,000 hinds, um, and 33,000 calves. So, give or take, uh, there's lots of caveats in there. That suggests that, you know, in the kind of in the region of 250, 275,000 red deer might produce that sustainable sporting harvest. The alternative uh, way of looking at it, which I think is where Mike Daniels was coming at it from last week, and I think we have some sympathy for, is, is you know, how many deer can the habitats in Scotland support? Now, that is a ridiculously complex question to answer on a national basis. But picking up on last week's discussion, if the magic number is five deer per 100 hectare, and I'm not sure that it is in, in many circumstances, then the Open Hill Red Deer range, the population might need to be in the order of 175,000. Having said all that, I think both of those lead you to the conclusion that in some parts of the country, we've probably got too many, too many red deer. Uh, and I think the key question for us, which you think is perhaps more important to answer, is um, what we do and, and where we focus effort to address that. Uh, can I thank, thank you for that response, because there was a, a risk that nobody would ever go into the real numbers, and I'm very grateful for it. Uh, would, would anybody else like to, to comment on that? Yeah, I, I would like to comment on it, because um, uh, when I took over as chairman of the, of the Deer Commission, uh, we, I made a conscious decision, or our board made a conscious decision, we would not talk about numbers, we would talk about impacts, because impacts are really what's, what's important. Um, it's very difficult to measure the number of red deer in Scotland. It's, it's impossible probably to, to even estimate other, other species. So that there's really, I don't think there's any value in doing that. What you have to look at is, is the local, local situation, the regional situation, and identify you know, how many deer you need um, to manage the habitat and to create uh, sufficient employment. And it's a matter of getting that balance right. And that has to be done locally uh, and not nationally. And that's why we decided not to never to mention national statistics because, first of all, it's very difficult to measure and we haven't got the resources to do it. And secondly, it's not really uh, tackling the issues that, that really deer management's about. I think, I, sorry, I, I, would, I would share exactly that, that view on impacts and um, we take that view in the National Park Authority as well. One, Another reason for being wary of having generalizations about deer numbers, for example, in the, in the, particularly in the eastern side of the National Park and the Angus Glens and parts of Deeside, uh, deer have more or less been eradicated for, um, from uh, grouse moors uh, in, in order to control tick that are affecting the grouse. Um, and that, so that obviously has resulted in a reduction in numbers overall in the area, but is that actually necessarily beneficial? Because, you know, any, anyone with a view to a balanced approach to deer is actually looking for deer as part of the landscape as well as, you know, as, well as reducing the numbers in order to uh, benefit the habitat. So um, it just adds an element that I think shows you need to be wary of making sort of generalizations and absolutely share that point of view that it's, it's, it's looking at the impacts in, in specific areas, not general. general. Could, I, could I just pursue that though? Because you mentioned earlier uh, that um, you had some properties where the you'd made a substantial cull and you could see the, the difference. Now, a question that nobody has yet addressed, I think, is the extent to which deer actually migrate. We know they roam, but if we take Scotland as being a continuum, more or less, then could you give me some idea of the speed with which a vacuum in Glen Esk, you since you've mentioned it, might be filled up from deer from further afield, or does a cull in an area really work for that area for a while? Well, 
I'm may, maybe better deferring to others, but but from what I've gathered from the people from land managers on the ground in the national park is that it can happen very quickly. You know, some some areas where culls have been uh, undertaken to allow woodland regeneration. One of the problems they have in the winter, obviously, you, you have a herd of 200 deer popping over the hill, and they all the good that's been done over the, the past six months can can get nibbled overnight and and be taken out. So th this is where, as as Robbie was saying, on on the sort of People talk about you need less than five deer per kilometer uh, as a density to allow woodland regeneration. Well, yes, but you know deer do move, and, and an incursion of 100 deer that's come from elsewhere can have huge impact, which is why we get into all these complications about whether you need fences or not. And all yes, that. but forgive, forgive me, can I? Can, can, I mean, yeah. But that's, that then leaves us back with the basic numbers, because if Scotland really is a continuum and these deer do move around, then I pick up the point about local impacts because an impact is always going to be local. But actually, the total numbers do matter because the moment you create a vacuum, others will migrate in. Yes, Pat? Well, yes, and I, I think um, in the submission we put, I, I highlighted the word vicious circle because I think that's what we've got in a number of areas where um, where you have an estate that's that's doing quite heavy culls in order to allow woodland regeneration. The neighbouring estates who, who want to maintain a, a, a decent sporting cull are very anxious about what's going on next door and therefore perhaps take the foot off the pedal a little bit in order to maintain higher numbers in that area and of course then you get the incursions into the area where they want fewer deer and they have to work harder even and increase their cull and, and you've got this kind of vicious circle going on and I think I think as you say it, what what needs to be looked at in some places is are the deer uh, for the the neighboring land where they want a sporting cull are they um, are they the right number for that sporting cull or are they more than they need? And I think what, what we need uh, collectively in deer management groups, and, and I think this is happening in a number of areas, is to find the right balance so that you're not getting these massive extremes and you're trying to find a more um, reasonable level of deer density across the board as well as um, targeting it, you know, more specifically in certain areas. Can I come in and make a point about the... The, I think you've got a, this idea of, of deer as a continuum. They aren't really a continuum because that, that you have subpopulations of deer, and they tend not to um, because there are barriers like rivers or, or mountain ranges and so on. They, you you tend to have to operate with it, and they won't move very much between between these subpopulations. And so when we're we're trying to to manage deer. Uh, one of the reasons for having a deer management group system is because uh, you know we're, they're dealing. Most management groups are dealing with a subpopulation of deer. And in that way, you can then manage them. Of course, they move large distances. I mean, to take an example, not far from Glenesca, if you take the Kinlochan area where we've had a section, or there's a Section 7 agreement, which has been there for 10 years. I mean, the first stage you have to do is to identify, you know, what the impacts obviously are. But then the next stage is to actually um, uh, count the number of deer, but also actually talk with the local stalkers about the movements that are going to be involved and where they're going to be in the summer and the winter and so on. And it's only when you, when, by doing that, that you can actually manage them effectively. And that's why you know, we need deer management groups and we need to deal with these subpopulations of deer. And that's much more important than talking about a continuum across Scotland, I believe. Uh, if I, yes, if I could add a couple of points uh, to, to that broad discussion. First on the question of numbers, certainly we also, on the National Forest State, can look at um, impacts rather than overall numbers. I think uh, two types of carrying capacity are a useful concept to have in mind. One is the ecological carrying capacity um, uh, of, of the land, um, and the other is um, the, the deer welfare carrying capacity of the land, particularly in terms of the, the ability of the land to support deer over winter. Um, and uh, so I, I, we find that a more helpful way of thinking than overall numbers. On deer movement, a um, couple of examples that I can bring to the table. We're certainly seeing the movement of red deer into parts of northeast Scotland where they've not been uh, for a long time. Um, that's an observation that we're, we're finding on the National Forest State. Uh, another good example is, is the, the movement of seeker deer around Scotland. I mean, they, uh, and typically uh, having this sort of uh, young juveniles uh, making sort of big movements across the landscape and, and now uh, uh, 
uh, inhabit many parts of Scotland from initial release points. Uh, so I think that demonstrates that deer can move uh, large distances across the landscape. Um, in terms of the forest enterprise Scotland Cull, we, we um, manage about 9% of Scotland's land area, but account for about a third of of the the national cull of deer and uh, part of that is because of the productivity of uh, of the, the habitats that we're trying to create on the national forest estate can support a very high uh, reproduction rate for deer but also in part it's because um, uh, when you create a vacuum by lower densities then um, the evidence is that you do get deer movement at least locally within within the landscape to uh, into into those more favorable habitats I'm just wondering could I could I just pursue the issue of subpopulations because I think this is the first we've heard about it is there such a thing as a map of the subpopulations of deer if they tend to stay in areas please well I think the <laughs> The map would, I mean, I think it's, there isn't a map of such a thing, but the, the deer management group system would provide, you know, some indication of those because the deer management groups were set up specifically to deal with subpopulations of deer. Now, sometimes that didn't work out and, and it hasn't, you know, other reasons have, have meant that you've got a, a, a deer management group. But basically they were set up originally uh, to deal with these subpopulations of deer. That's precisely the point that I was going to come to. I'm delighted to hear that that was at least the initial idea because clearly they should be. Yeah. yeah, just to add to that, I mean, we have populations of deer across Scotland and there is quite a lot of good local knowledge about how both hinds and stags move. Hinds are hefted traditionally. They will have a range, so they do move. But key to all of that is local understanding about how populations respond. And I think that's why it's difficult to draw too many comparisons about how successful places like Craig Meggy or Glen Feshi are because they're all dependent on local circumstances. Uh, so a, a lot will depend on if we are going to remove deer or reduce deer numbers in, sig in significant amounts. A really good understanding of what that means in terms of deer movements is required. Um, we talked about the Angus Glens. Uh, and again, just to be clear, if we are going to maintain deer numbers at very, very low levels, I want everybody to be clear about the amount of time, energy and effort that is required in doing that, because it does require men on the ground 365 days a year often through the day and through the night as well, to deal with those animals when they do occasionally encroach. And they do, but a lot will depend on the risk of that happening, depends on the landscape and how they're moving locally. So I would support John's point. Thank you. Alec Ferguson. Um, thank you, convener. I just, um, and, and good morning, gentlemen. <coughs> um, <clears throat> I, I just wanted to try and look a little bit deeper at this question of balance, which um, is inherent within the Wayne Bill and the Code of Practice. It's all about trying to find a balance between um, economic, social and, and um, uh, other factors. And uh, indeed, Dr. Milne said the trick is to try to get the right balance. And it's clear, and it's become very clear last week and this, that um, th th when it comes to populations, uh, environmental bodies have a different idea of what the right balance is to sporting uh, interests. So there are, there are clear differences within that and trying to achieve that balance is obviously not easy but I think as um, Mr Boyd Wallace said in his opening remarks in, in that the Cairn Gorms is a good example of how that balance apparently can be achieved. Now it was also mentioned that, that you, can have, you can have a deer management group area where most of the owners agree what that balance should be, but you might get one that doesn't. And, and again, we had an example of that last week. And, and what I really wanted to ask is, particularly to SNH and Mr. Cunahan, is given that you, know, you are the overseeing body uh, uh, for the deer management system uh, that is now in place, that only has just come into place through the code of practice, what is your role in a, in a circumstance like that? And how do you try to bring about that balance? Well, you're absolutely right. I mean, we are the government body tasked with the conservation, control and sustainable management of deer. So it is absolutely within our gift to try and help estates and deer management groups come to terms with how they reconcile some of those conflicting objectives. Uh, and again, cards on the table. It is by no means easy in, in many situations. I think just through um, the kind of growth in, in more uh, complex and conflicting objectives, that we see in, in, in the Red Deer range now, we've got a range of, of different owners with a range of different aspirations. Uh, it's becoming more commonplace for these conflicts to arise. Uh, you mentioned traditionally deer management groups were set up primarily to, to manage a sporting resource. And they did that reasonably well, I must confess. It was all about 
um, then working together to work, to work out how best to sustainably harvest sporting stags. But those expectations placed on deer management groups now have been increasing for some time, so they are more complex. Um, how they balance woodland objectives, conservation objectives, um, to a lesser extent, uh, forestry and agriculture have been largely dealt with through the legislation for a long time. But our role, I think, in, in now that we have the code for the first time articulating the, the types of behaviour we would expect uh, of all landowners, actually, environmental bodies, private sporting estates, even public bodies, to, to step up. Um, deer management groups, are, we are hoping, can provide the framework for a mature discussion, uh, being clear on what everybody's objectives are, with a certain amount of respect for those objectives. Um, and reconciling where, where some of those objectives are incompatible, at least we can go through a mature process of dialogue and discussion and potentially compromise, uh, ideally le looking to reach consensus. That is, the, that is the principle with which we would like to see the voluntary system continue. But where that breaks down, and I think it does break down from time to time, um, often when there are public interests involved, uh, and our focus has been on designated sites for, for 10 years or so, so we are intervening in that system uh, in an attempt to kind of regulate it, or at least try and provide a, f a framework for, for those uh, more formal and mature discussions to take place. Um, and I think that is the challenge which, which the code throws down to the whole sector, really. And again, it's about trying to ensure everybody reads the code and is, is cognizant of what it's telling them, because I think it is a shared responsibility. And I, and I think all I can say is that where the voluntary system doesn't work, that we have got a role to play to step in and intervene, whether that is through additional Section 7s or whether it is actually through compulsory measures in Section 8. That's what we're tasked to do, and I think that's what we're equipped to do. Uh, the fact that we haven't required um, or relied on compulsory measures to date, uh, I don't actually think necessarily reflects the fact that those measures are not, in, not usable, but it actually just demonstrates our willingness to make the voluntary system work. But I don't underestimate the difficulty that, 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 that we have now when we begin to introduce additional public interests like carbon sequestration, like the importance of peatlands and, and um, adaptive management in terms of resilience of ecosystems uh, and some of the targets we've set ourselves for biodiversity. Because all of these expectations being placed on estates and deer management groups are relatively new. They're only just getting their head around designated sites from, a, from you know, realistically, and that's taken an awful long time. So this, I think what we're seeing in the code for the first time is some of these public interests being articulated, and it will be difficult for DMGs to reconcile what that actually means for them and, and how they respond. But we have a job in, in helping lead them through that. Thank you very much. I think we'll come back to some of that later, so that will do me just now. Graham, thank Dave. you. First uh, yes, uh, thank you. In, in terms of striking a balance and the public interest being uh, held, how can that happen if... Is that it now? Okay, thank you. The so the, the, point, the point I was making is in terms of protecting the public interest, the environmental voice has to be heard in these settings. How can that happen if, as we were told last week in evidence, or it was claimed in evidence, that in some instances those who are trying to articulate that view feel they're in an intimidating atmosphere? Yeah, I, I, I listened to that discussion last week with, with some interest. Uh, and again, I go back to the point where Originally, we recognise where deer management groups have come from, uh, traditionally to, to manage deer for sport, managing that shared resource. Uh, they inevitably have gone, or they've been on a bit of a journey in that time, recognising that some of the expectations being placed upon them have changed. Uh, I think, certainly through my time in the last 10 years or more um, in attending DMGs, I do recognise that significant cultural shift taking place, um, that there is a wider public interest in deer. Um, and some of that has been driven, I would suggest, exclusively by the change of focus in the Deer Commission over the last 10 years, uh, uh, specifically trying to tackle designated sites. Um, and more and more estates and DMGs now, I think, are proactively engaged with, with, with conducting their own habitat impact assessments and recognising that there, is, there are other interests at stake here. Um, having been to quite a few DMGs in my early days as a member of staff of the DCS, they can be quite intimidating forums to come into. Uh, 
But again, I think quite a lot of that perhaps reflects the need to, to ensure that there is respect for different legitimate objectives, about the need to, to build and ensure trust between members of the group. Certainly when new members come in, there is a need for that report to be established. Um, and again, I would also reflect the fact that we've got good examples of DMGs that are very inclusive. Uh, they are very uh, open and transparent, um, to name but a few. Um, West Ross, uh, South Ross, they're all, they've got very strong links with local community and are generally quite produ productive and approachable for anybody. But we still have a few deer management groups that are relatively closed uh, and they can be quite difficult uh, forums for people to come in and, and raise concerns without necessarily uh, not being intimidated, but it's, it's not always a straightforward discussion. But I do actually think that cultural shift is taking place, albeit slowly, more slowly than some people might like. Um, well, obviously, I have a lot of experience of deer management groups. As, uh, when I was the, the chairman of, uh, for the deer commission, I, I visited virtually all of the deer management groups, and um, and so I've you know quite a, a, a range of experiences that, that, of attending them. I mean, as the chairman, I was I was treated with you know with respect, but that was not necessarily the case always for for staff members. Um, because th that was just the way they worked. I think the uh, important thing that Robbie says is that is actually deer management groups are changing, but they're actually t having to change because there's been a, a, there's a huge range, of, much bigger range of objectives that, that the state owners have than they had in the past. Uh, and there is so, and this actually creates a lot more conflict than it did in the previously. Equally well, you must recognise that deer management groups uh, also can, uh, have members who fall out for other reasons altogether. And therefore, you know, there is a potential for, for um, conflict to arise, not, not to do with deer or anything like that, but el elsewhere. And this makes um, managing a deer management group difficult. I mean, I've spoken to many chairmen who have just despaired of trying to make their deer management group work because of the fact that, they, that, that you have these conflicting objectives and, uh, and it's very difficult to reconcile them. Now, one way forward has been to try and develop deer management plans. And... Uh, in doing that, you bring in a consultant to actually develop the plan, and that consultant actually very much acts as a mediator. And so that mediator um, can actually help to bring a group together. But I, I believe there's a, lack of, oh, there's a lack of consultants out there, and there's a lack of, of abilities within the deer management group sector itself to actually be able to fulfil that role. And that was why... Um, that you know, coming on to this idea of a duty on on um, land managers, this, we felt this was the only way forward for actually, you know, actually delivering what needs to be delivered in terms of the public interest as well as the private interest. That you, you, that you had this duty, whereby you you were empowering really the, the landowners to actually manage their deer, but within a within a, a set of, of a framework which was which is now arrived as the code. But the problem is that the code is voluntary and therefore it doesn't, well, not necessarily be adhered to. It doesn't have to be adhered to. And the, the powers under the Section 7, under, particularly under Section 8, um, are, 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 in my view, still very difficult to use and require a huge amount of effort to make sure that if there is a legal challenge, that the government is then not having to pick up a huge bill at the end of the day. So that that's, I, that's my comments I would like to make on, on your question. Thank you, that's useful. Uh, Will and then uh, Simon. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I too can add a perspective on this. I've had nearly 20 years' experience with deer management groups from North West Sutherland to Noidart through now to the Cairngorms. And, and in that time, I have seen quite a dramatic change. I mean, I haven't been back to North West Sutherland recently, but um, I have noticed how, um, you know, I think deer management groups have reluctantly, in some cases, changed, and they are much more inclusive than they used to be. Um, and I think they've recognised that they have to be more inclusive and have to respect more uh, wider interests. And one thing, you know, we were trying to achieve with the deer framework in the National Park, which CDAG, the deer advisory group, helped produce, uh, was to uh, foster that spirit of trust and understanding and cooperation. And that was seen as a first step of building relationships and helping to move things on and improve the situation. And that, I think, has been very positive. And I also think uh, the ADMG's principle, I think there's six, seven principles, I can't remember now, that they are really trying to get people to adopt, I think is a really positive step because I think what's been said loud and clear there is respect on both sides, not just on one side. So I think, I think things are moving in the right direction. Simon? I'd also like to recognise the positive role that the Association of Deer Management Groups is playing. Um, 
and uh, you know the the extent to which they're encouraging the individual deer management groups um, to adopt these principles uh, that Will was mentioning, which I think are very positive. Um, from a National Forest Estate point of view, you know, we've also been on a journey, um, and part of that is about recognising the deer management objectives of uh, other landowners and our neighbours, uh, rather than seeing the problem as being over the march, to increasingly recognise that these challenges are shared and we need to find joint solutions, and ADMG has worked hard to do that. One of the things that would be good to see is a broader basis of representation at deer management groups. I think possibly one of the reasons why um, s s some might uh, find them intimidating is because of uh, the attendance. And, uh, you know, it would be good to have uh, a wider representation of land use interests represented at deer management groups, um, including uh, a, a, a greater number of, um, of those representing environmental interests in the locality, but also agricultural interests and the like. And um, I, I think that, that would actually be very positive in terms of opening up the discussion in individual localities and helping to ensure that that balance of views is pitched in uh, in each locality at each meeting. Um, Robbie Kerner. Just, just to, to, to close on this point, perhaps, I, I, I do agree that administration and leadership of these groups is key. ADMG are providing a lead nationally, but I think the important thing is, is, is that needs, that mantle needs to be picked up locally. So there does need to be quite a lot of time, energy, effort and resource to create the most productive space and tone for meetings. And again, I think my experience of that is variable. Um, again, we've got good examples of, of DMGs that involve the police, that involve the local fire service, that involve the local community council. But, but, but those examples are perhaps few and far between. Yes, something if I may. So, in reality, does the fact that the majority of DMGs don't currently have plans, does that provide an opportunity to address the situation? But can we take that opportunity without being more prescriptive? Can we trust that they will do the right thing in terms of protecting the natural uh, heritage and environment? Can I make a, a comment just about plans? The, the, I mean, plans are a very good idea. And I was actually involved way back in 15 years ago in actually the first six management plans that were developed for deer management groups where I was actually actively involved in. Um, and uh, what we've, we, we were very pleased in the way they were developed as I was, I was much younger then. And, and, um, but then there was a study done three years after, after they'd been put in place. And it was found that the, the, the plans hadn't been updated, that they really weren't following the plans. And I, my experience has been that even you know, since then is that um, deer management groups that actually have developed plans tend not to use them properly and tend not to update them. Now, the management plan is a, is a good exercise in, in getting you know, some sort of consensus going. But then it needs then continual delivery, and that tends not to happen. And that's why you know, plans are a good thing, but it's the, it's the operation after that that's also as important. But we'll come back on to some more detail about plans a little later on. We've uh, straight off the, the numbers. And before we move off the numbers at the moment and on to um, the impacts, a small point. Um, last week, I raised uh, an email from Lisbeth Routhing, the uh, owner of Carrower, 50,000 acres in the West Central Highland area, and claimed that there were 55 deer per square kilometre in SSSI's next door. I have in front of me the SNH Ben Alder deer count for July 2013 that confirms this. Um, and indeed, there are some blocks where there's over 100 deer per square kilometre. Um, would uh, the SNH agree that, in fact, what Elizabeth Rousing said was correct. Yeah, happy to confirm. When we undertake a deer count, um, we use helicopters, we use digital cameras. Uh, deer will occasionally move and respond to that stimulus, so it doesn't surprise me that in certain parts of that count we will see very large concentrations of numbers, which, if you look at it in that, set, in that situation, uh, we might see 100 plus in a group in a, in a very small space. Um, we've got photographs and evidence of 1,100 red deer in one photograph. 
So when you actually look at that in terms of density figures and scale it up, you will see densities of, of that type. But the only caveat to that is it's a snapshot in time whilst we were flying, whilst we were taking a photograph, which is what's translated into a map. And you do need to think about what that's actually saying, because from a management point of view, we're really just trying to count a sensible area with, to try and get a total number of deer with which to think about how we then advise on management. So uh, I would be careful of reading too much into a single density figure in a certain point in time. So it would ne therefore be useful to look at the West Central uh, Deer Management Group's uh, report, which uh, Richard Cook was uh, uh, showing us last week, to see just exactly how it is over the whole of their area. Yeah, and, and again, just the case in point, whilst we might have concentrations of deer of that type, it's the impact those deer are having which is important. So if we see large groups of deer across some of those sensitive peatlands and, and the tracking impacts they can have, that's what gives us cause for concern, not necessarily 100 deer per square kilometre at any one point in time. It's the impacts that's more important. Yeah. OK. Um, Alec Ferguson wanted a supplementary on that. Yeah, it's just to clarify that absolute point, because just for the record, when you, when you get a number like that, counting by helicopter... The fact is they are there at that point in time. That is not a permanent stocking rate. Um, it's just that they happen to be there at that time. Yeah, I mean, again, throughout the country, when we, when we undertake census and we do it on a regular basis, we will come up with an absolute population, uh, which is relative to that area we've counted. It will throw up a range of densities from zero to 100. Uh, but all we're really seeking to do is, is to provide a population estimate within which we subsequently manage. Uh, yeah, those deer are, are transient, they will move, they were only there at a specific snapshot in time, so it's difficult to read too much into that. It was part of the SAC designated area. Absolutely, and, and, and in that part of Midwest where we're looking at, at some of the impacts of, on the Monoliths SAC, uh, and in Midwest uh, where we're looking at Ben Alder, some of these issues about summering density of deer on these sensitive upland habitats are, are where we are concerned, so we need to think about just exactly what we can do to try and reduce that pressure. Thank you. Uh, Jim Hume. Uh, thanks very much. This, um, good morning, uh, gentlemen. Uh, this may be directly to SNH, but others might have, have views also. It's regarding the impact, and we've had, uh, obviously, conflict and evidence uh, last week on the impact deer are having on designa uh, designated sites and their features. And uh, I've had Jamie Will Williamson mention the, the, the Monalia SAC uh, bog which had been considered to be damaged, but then a review from uh, an aerial photograph showed that it was actually recovering. And then we had Scottish Environment Link saying that there's some sites all, all they need to do to get a, be categorised as, favor, as favourable uh, recovering was to actually just have a, a plan rather than any difference o on the actual ground. So it's quite conflicting views on actual impacts of uh, deer on sites and how they are assessed. So I'd be interested to find out what the actual impact deer are having on designated sites and their, fe and their features and how deer impact is actually assessed and how that assessment uh, can be assessed with, obviously, factors like uh, other factors having an effect on, on the site, such as uh, perhaps sheep grazing, hare grazing, of, of course, and perhaps weathering, etc. Yeah, I'm happy to have a go at that. Um, so I think we've already talked about the fact that deer do play a significant ecological role in the uplands in Scotland, uh, principally through grazing or vegetation, but also trampling. Um, we've got a history of grazing and burning in Scotland, which is why we have these open landscapes, which uh, we, we largely value today. Um, those vegetation communities are kept in check, principally by grazing, both by deer and domestic stock, principally. Um, and that does create and maintain these open moorland and peatland habitats, and all the benefits they provide. I mean, they are internationally rare, which is why we value them so much. In terms of measurement, uh, we can get a broad indication of grazing, um, which can be seen at a distance. You know, uh, from a woodland point of view, that might be a lack of understory. Um, from a from a moorland point of view, it might be kind of greyish heather or high grass to heather contact contact um, on the hill. But in order to really understand what's going on, we need much more detailed assessments. Um, to really understand the impacts that deer are having and whether that, those impacts are actually resulting in damage to habitats. Uh, those measurements might take the form of looking in more detail at um, browsing on dwarf shrubs. So some of our heather and ericaceous species, we can actually measure uh, the offtake that, that herbivores are having. 
um, or some of the more sensitive peatland or flush habitats, we can look at the impact trampling is actually having and, and quantify that. Uh, those measures can then be compared and quantified against levels which we know will lead to deterioration of those habitats over time. Um, for example, at certain levels of offtake, if we're looking at more than 66% offtake of heather shoots, over time that will lead to heather loss. Uh, that's not good from anybody's point of view. Certainly from a biodiversity point of view, it's not good. It'll be replaced by more resilient uh, grassland species, which are perhaps uh, actually have not much benefit to, to, to the herbivores themselves uh, or the, certainly the land manager. Um, so w we know that that can happen at a certain level of grazing and trampling, and we can we can assess that and measure that against the kind of aspirations for what we think the grazing regime should be. In terms of the balance of whether it's sheep or deer, again, that comes back to the point where we need to have good information about deer numbers and domestic stock to think about what management we're going to put in place to balance some of that. Because in certainly large parts of our uplands, we are trying to balance both wild deer and domestic stock. So we need to look at the numbers involved and actually think about where that balance actually lies. You mentioned uh, some of the information we have about uh, feature condition on designated sites. And again, in our written submission, I think we've tried to quantify that to a certain extent. Um, and, and in doing so, we've principally focused on, on the red deer range. But again, if you look at it in the Scottish context, there are 2,500 features out there in designated sites which could be impacted by grazing. You know, 80% of those plus are actually in reasonable, reasonable condition. Um, but in the Red Deer range, we have got some specific concerns about the state of our woodland features, uh, about some of our uplands and peatlands, and I've tried to quantify that in, in our submission. Uh, whilst I think on the face of it, we can still be confident that, that generally across the country, things are okay. Uh, don't underestimate the scale of the challenge which we have in trying to reconcile some of these difficult things about some of our most important woodland SACs, about some of our peatland habitats and how best to sustain them over time. Um, I think there's also two important points just to kind of reflect on that is that it's, it's, it's quite difficult to think about what tools we have available to us to try and ensure that we get the right balance and we're providing advice, we're providing guidance, we're trying to provide incentive through, you know, if it is wintering of sheep, uh, off wintering, how best to do that and make, make the best uh, we can in terms of balance agricultural infrastructure and rural business but at the same time understand what we can do to influence wild deer management and that's, that's quite challenging in itself. Um, I think it can also just reflect a little bit about what progress we've made in the last three years. So certainly within the upland red deer range, we've taken on, you know, we've secured management of another 90 features out of, the, out of all of those um, woodland and peatland and, and, and upland features, which is good. It's, it's good progress. And that, and that progress includes Section 7 control agreements. It includes rural development contracts. So we've got management in place, which... <coughs> Over time, we believe that grazing prescription will lead to favourable condition, but these habitat, takes, these habitat types take a long time to respond. So all we can really do is try and put in place management which we think over time will lead us towards favourable condition, and we're seeing, we're seeing some of that. But at the same time, as new information comes to light, site uh, condition monitoring is a cyclical process, so we're constantly getting feedback about condition of other sites. So at the same time as securing 90 features, We've got another 50 which have come, come back to us as, as unfavourable. So it's a constant dynamic situation. Uh, and again, how realistic is it for us to expect to have 100% of these features in favourable condition at any one time? Uh, I suspect we'll struggle. And on the point that Scottish Environment Link made, stating that all you needed to do to have a, a designated site categorised as uh, favourable recovering would, was to have a plan. I mean, is that, is that correct? Or, or would... You you disagree with that? No, so there's various categories which we might uh, assign to, to a designated site or a feature. It can be favourable and we're quite comfortable, everything's fine, but if it's unfavourable and declining uh, or unfavourable and, and not changing, we need to think about what management we might put in place to try and address that. Uh, the feature's not going to change overnight from unfavourable to favourable, therefore all we can really do is try and put a plan in place. It might be a rural priority contract which has got domestic stock prescription, off-wintering, reduction stock numbers. It might involve reduction of deer numbers. Uh, but once we've actually got a contract in place and we're happy that contract will be seen through, then we can assign that feature unfavourable recovering because we believe the management prescriptions which we have identified and worked with owners will, over time, lead to reduction of those grazing impacts. Uh, I don't really see what else we can do. <laughs> so so, so just, to, just to clarify that, because... Um, there's still a, a little bit uh, doubt there. You're, say, you're saying that you would designate favourable recovering if there was a plan, but 
there, there wasn't any signs of any recovering on the ground yet. Is, is that correct? Well, uh, so again, understanding the, the nature of the, the plan, some of it might actually require monitoring in year to see uh, if the, the management prescription is working. A Section 7 control agreement is a good, is a good example whereby if we sign a, a Section 7 control agreement, um, we're comfortable that we've identified the management which might be required, but that is subject to monitoring on a regular basis to annual meetings to kind of review that and perhaps change management prescription in light of that. So it's an example where it's quite a live process. There are other examples such as management agreements or, or rural priorities whereby it may well be that we've got a five-year contract and at the end of five years we might come back to that site and, and not necessarily see the progress that we might have liked to have done. A lot of it actually depends on what measures are in place to, to be able to adapt to what information is coming to light. Okay, no, let's clarify that quite well. Thanks. Okay, fine. And um, we'll move on to Angus McDonald's. Okay, thank you, uh, convener. Good morning, panel. Um, just staying with uh, designated sites, um, but, but broadening it out to the, the wider countryside, um, we've been told that the work of the, the previous uh, Deer Commission um, and now SNH is focused on, on designated sites, um, presumably partly through uh, lack of resources. Um, which has resulted in the impacts of deer on a considerable proportion of the land area uh, grazed by deer species that, that haven't been dealt with. Um, now, last week, uh, Scottish Environment Link Deer Task Force told the committee that there was not good evidence on the impact of deer in the, the wider countryside. And in addition, last week, the John Muir Trust referred to uh, the recent survey of native woodland, which was commissioned by uh, Forestry Commission Scotland, which... Um, hasn't been published yet, but we do have a, a, a little bit of detail um, on it. Um, for example, I believe that uh, uh, every area of native woodland, more than uh, 0.5 hectares in size, has been assessed. Um, could the panel uh, tell us why is SNH's work focused uh, on deer impacts on designated sites solely, and how are deer impacts in the wider countryside monitored? Yeah, happy to start that conversation, Angus, in the fact that I think going back 10, 15 years ago, uh, the Red Deer Commission used to try and advise deer management groups on what we thought the appropriate uh, population should be in terms of stags and hinds. At that time, again, it, it was principally aimed at providing a sporting return, but not exclusively. What we found was that uh, often uh, cult, our advisory cull targets were not being met uh, and we were putting quite a lot of time, energy and effort into, into providing that advice to DMGs. I think at the time, and, and John can perhaps say a little bit more than, uh, on this, that we took a conscious decision to try and focus and target our resources uh, on those areas of the public interest, which were at most at risk. Uh, and at that time, again, the, the focus was very much on designated sites. We've got European designated sites which were in urgent need of attention. Therefore, that's why we took a strategic decision to, to prioritise our resource in tackling those issues rather than continuing to try and support DMGs at a national level. Um, so that's why the focus has been on designated sites. It was absolutely resource driven. Uh, and again, I think picking up on the point about our attention to designated sites at the cost of wider countryside. I think to try and put that in context, I can use a few examples to say whilst it is principally focused at tackling designated sites, there is wider countryside benefit. Uh, I used two or three examples. Can lock an example we've talked about briefly today. So in 2003, we signed a Section 7 control agreement in Kinlochan, so 10 estates in the Angus Glens, um, covering um, 35,000 hectares. Um, the designated site in itself is actually significantly less than that. You know, so we've reduced the population from 12,000 deer to, to 5,000 deer in that time. So whilst that will have benefited the designated site, the control area has been much, much wider. Bridalban Hills, recently we signed a Section 7 control agreement, um, which 75,000 hectares, um, 30, just under 30 properties, only 16,000 hectares of that control area is designated site. So there are wider knock-on benefits to wider countryside. Um, but we're just using designated sites as a stimulus to try and tackle that at a catchment scale which is appropriate to the problem. So certainly for some of these big upland sites, we are using designated sites as a focus, but we know there is additional benefit to that. And maybe let Simon or John or will add to that from a woodland perspective as well. 
couple of um, points on the woodland aspects. We, we assess damage levels in, in, uh, in the woodlands across the state, you know, including outside designated areas. Uh, our evidence suggests that uh, over half of um, our woodland areas are um, noticeably affected by deer browsing. Um, about 15% uh, are affected to a level that uh, you know is a is a major concern to us. That's when the uh, the leading shoots of the trees uh, get eaten away. More widely, you mentioned the Native Woodland Survey for Scotland. Uh, that's not something that I lead on in Forest Enterprise Scotland, but I did have a word with my colleague in Forestry Commission Scotland on this because I saw it in the evidence. The data hasn't been published yet, but uh, you're right to suggest that. Um, Across the survey, uh, uh, across the woodland survey, the majority of woodlands showed some evidence of browsing, although um, it's not, necessar not, not definitively possible to uh, indicate what did the browsing. Uh, it could be livestock as well as deer, but about one third of the native woodlands surveyed uh, uh, had high or very high damage levels that would be judged to have an impact on biodiversity. That data hasn't been published yet and will be published relatively soon. Can I just uh, add to what Robbie said in that uh, we did make that decision to, to concentrate on designated sites because of resource limitations. We were aware that we were then not uh, looking at the non-designated site areas just because of resource limitations not because we didn't think there was damage occurring, but just because we just didn't have the resources to do it. And obviously because the Scottish Government was driving us to make sure that the designated sites were in, in favourable condition because they had a responsibility on that. Um, so I think in terms of, of the non-designated sites, there isn't the information there because it's costly to get uh, and it hasn't been obtained. And so therefore, and also if you then look at, um, I suspect, the culls that take place on 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 many of the areas that are in non-designated sites are, are much less than those that are taking place in, in, in designated sites. And one, the only way that we can actually manage that at the moment is through the voluntary deer management group system. And uh, the, the issue with that is, of course, that, that you know, if that's not working very well, then we're actually not getting much of a handle on that at all. And that's an, another reason why uh, the Deer Commission put forward the idea for duty, because this would actually allow us to get a much better grip on, on an issue that we hadn't the resources to do, which was in relation to um, non-designated sites. Can I, can I just add one thing on that, in, um, about best practice guidance, which SNH now administer after DCS, and that's been a really important element on the wider countryside of encouraging uh, estates to take their own initiative in terms of monitoring the habitats. And uh, so both we and SNH in the National Park have been uh, training people up to help them to go out and do their own monitoring on their own sites. So that's, that's one way of sharing the cost, but also uh, making sure that the people, the stalkers on the ground, are there directly involved in that monitoring, which has been quite useful. It's been taken up quite widely, but we'd like to see it taken up more widely as well. Thank you very much. Yeah. Any further? Just to pick up on the um, um, Forestry Commission's report, do you, do you have a, a more... A precise idea of, of when we can expect to see the, the report published on uh, on, uh, on on native woodland. Uh, no, I don't. But we can we can give the committee that information. <coughs> That'd be good. Thanks. Is that all just now? Um, then we move on to Cara Hilton. Uh, good morning. Um, I've got a question that I'd like to ask all the panel members. It's mainly, most of the debate so far has been about the impact of red deer. Um, what evidence is available about the impact of other species of de the, the impact the other species of deer are having? Um, I think, for the, the purpose of submitting our written evidence today, we have primarily focused on red deer because um, there's no doubt that uh, in terms of the challenges they pose, uh, the complexity of ownership uh, and the significance of the problem in the uplands, that's where most of our focus has been. But that, that is not to get away from the fact that we know the other species of deer can and do impact upon natural heritage outcomes. Um, these issues to do with deer and woodlands are certainly not restricted to Red Deer Range. Uh, there are a number of woodland sites in Strathclyde and Ayrshire, 
in Dumfries and Galloway, uh, in the borders and in Forth. Uh, smaller woodland sites and, and, and principally uh, in unfavourable condition, perhaps largely down to, to road here. But the challenge of actually sorting those out, Cara, is, is significantly less. You know, we're not talking about the same complexity of ownership and the same scale. But that's not to say there are not problems with other species. It's even experience in some of these woodlands where we know the focus has been on red deer. I use Mar Lodge as an example. Uh, one of the best examples of, of pine weed we have uh, in, in the highlands in, in the Cairngorms. Um, quite a lot of the focus at that time was on red deer management. In actual fact, when you start going out at night and looking at the numbers of roe deer involved, uh, the estate staff at the National Trust for Scotland took out 350 roe deer of that, out of that woodland in one year. And it was amazing just to see the response that the, the vegetation uh, and the seedlings re resulted in that. So it's, it's, it's easy to talk about red deer, but we mustn't lose sight of the impact that some of these other deer species are having. Simon. I can yes. uh, give information about um, the culling activity on the National Forest Estate. The estate is distributed reasonably well across Scotland, and um, roe deer actually make up 40% of our overall cull of deer. Uh, red deer make up 40%, and uh, uh, seeker deer and fallow deer the remaining. So I can confirm that uh, certainly within on the National Forest Estate and within woodland situations, roe deer are a major issue for us, um, but less of an issue in terms of their movement across the landscape because they do tend to be more hefted into uh, a particular parts of the landscape. Um, Bill? In the, in the National Park, we've got red, roe deer, seeker, uh, fallow, and reindeer as well, quite, which is quite unique. Um, and the roe deer, anecdotally, do seem to be expanding. Um, and so, but it's hard to gauge, from my perspective, how much of an impact that is. But it's definitely something that more and more deer management groups seem to be getting um, more concerned about. Seeker deer are largely limited to the west and are also thought to be expanding uh, with potential impacts on hybridisation with red deer, which is a whole separate issue. Fallow deer are not very common at all. But the reindeer, I would might mention, actually, obviously they're a semi-domestic herd brought in in the early 50s. And to date haven't been much of an issue and they're, they're regarded as a really great tourism attraction and, and very popular so I'm, I'm going to be very careful what I say about reindeer but uh, especially in the run-up to Christmas but uh, there, there are concerns about the reindeer herd actually uh, particularly in relation to some of the estates like Abernethy estate for example where they're trying to expand the native woodland there through natural regeneration and reindeer don't just limit their diet to mosses and lichens they, they do particularly like deciduous trees as well. So there, there is a recognised uh, concern there about reindeer, whether it's reached a level uh, where there is a need for a cull, and obviously that would be an interesting thing for us to have to contemplate in the park. Can I just make a comment the, yes. in relation to roe deer? Because, I mean, roe deer numbers have increased a lot in the last uh, 10 years or so, partly because we've created new woodland and, and also um, agricultural crops which, which are growing in the winter, which is ideal feed for them. And so, therefore, the numbers have increased, particularly in the central belt, where we've had more, um, more woodland. And, uh, and therefore, the, the consequence of that, unless you have the sort of culling levels that the Forestry Commission in Scotland operate, you're going to get more and more damage. And in, in the private woodland sector, uh, those levels are not often, uh, not often, not often achieved. And so I, I think the, the, the problem is going to increase there. And also, because of the central belt issue, the encroachment of deer into urban areas has increased uh, with its some negative consequences as well as positive consequences. And of course, the road number, number of road traffic accidents have also increased. Um, in the legislation, there is a, the, the, the legislation changed the, the use of panels slightly. And this will be an opportunity for SNH to actually use these panels to actually manage deer in in those sort of circumstances, which currently they're not being so well managed. Thank you. Okay, um, we've got a couple of supplementaries in this, Graham Day and then Jim Hume. Uh, yeah, thank you. This is principally, I think, directed at SNH. In the written evidence, there's a reference that you provided, there's a reference to the fact you're currently carrying out more detailed work to distinguish between red deer and other herbivore impacts. Presumably that takes in sheep, mountain hares, that type of thing. I'm just wondering, what you could tell us about that at, at this stage? Um, well, certainly, again, as I think I alluded to earlier on, uh, what we can do when we're undertaking uh, habitat impact assessments is be absolutely clear about the level of offtake uh, and in terms of how herbivores are influencing the condition of vegetation communities. What's 
what's less easy to do is, is be able to uh, attribute some of those impacts to, to different species. Our, our knowledge base on, on hair abundance, for example, is not as good as it could be because we don't really have too many reliable methods to, to estimate the numbers and abundance of mountain hair, some of which has been covered recently in the press. So we do want to, to we're doing some work with James Hutton and the Game Wildlife Conservation Trust to better understand the tools available to us to, to, to better estimate uh, mountain hair numbers. Um, but again, I go back to the point where uh, we're doing some work just to understand the the real local issues associated with domestic stock and wild deer on certain sites, because they do use the sites slightly differently. Uh, and as a result, we need to be a little bit better informed about uh, just exactly what the right management measure might look like. We have talked about some of the, the options on the rural priorities about off-wintering sheep or about um, more actively shepherding stock and whether or not we can actually manipulate sheep populations on some of those habitats where we know the grazing requirement is, is a little bit more complex. If I may, um, so in, in undertaking that work, are you also taking account of the impact of climate change already so that we, are, we have much reduced snow levels now compared to previous years? Certainly some endangered plant species are being exposed because of that and are being nibbled by hares, etc., etc. Is all that kind of being factored into the work that you're doing? Yeah, I mean, picking up on the point Jamie Williamson made last week about uh, peatlands and the monoliths, I think we do accept our, for some of these upland peatland habitats, the, the ecology of them is, is very complicated. There is no doubt in my mind at all that, that there's a whole dose of things influencing the condition of peatland habitats. Certainly at that altitude, um, wind, weather, erosion are all contributing and contributing significantly to the condition of that site. All we're really doing is when we're looking at herbivore impacts is trying to be better understand the current impacts those herbivores are having and to what extent they are influencing the condition of the site because that's something we can do that's something we can do something about. What becomes more difficult is how we try and prevent some of that erosion and peat loss through wind, wind and water. Uh, we're, we're already actively thinking about uh, draining peatland systems in the monoliths, about reseeding some of that exposed bare peat, which is subject to all of those other influencing factors. Um, and it is complex, but I think what we can say is that we know herbivores are contributing to poor conditions in some of these peatland sites, and that is something which we can actively manage. It's not, it's not the solution to the, to the whole problem, but it's something which is within our gift. Just going to pick up on, on, on the Sika deer. Obviously, Sika aren't uh, native to, to Scotland. They're actually from East Asia. And Sika, I think, is Japanese for deer, so it actually means deer, deer, if you, if you, if you translate it. But, um, oh dear, <laughs> indeed. But um, I, I think Will mentioned that there was an expanding problem with Sika in West Highlands, it would be interesting if that is an expanding problem in other parts of Scotland, obviously. You also mentioned hybridisation with red deer. I wonder if there's any evidence that they're actually hybridising with uh, roe deer uh, as well. Is that something that's happening or not? But, so two, two points to that. Yeah, I'll just carry on then on, on that very quickly. Um, we did some research, we researched with Josephine Pemberton of Edinburgh University, who, who's done a lot of work on Seeker. And, um, assessed the hybridisation levels and there was there was some very small evidence of hybridisation with red deer. They never hybridised with roe deer ever. But um, saying it was an increasing problem, it's hard to gauge. I mean, it's anecdotally there are more, more seeker have been found in, in some other areas of the National Park and they are predominantly to the west of the River Space. So it's probably better for Rob, Robbie to comment on whether they're an increasing problem across Scotland. <laughs> That's really just... Um in uh, response to the question about um, understanding whether impacts are from red deer or other species, just two, two points to mention. Certainly, in woodland conditions, we can often uh, gain some evidence as to what's doing the damaging by the nature of the damage, but also when we undertake deer density assessments, um, I won't go into the sordid details, but basically you look at dung counts, and um, clever people can actually tell uh, what's produced the dung. So we do actually have, uh, we do collect information on, on what, what uh, herbivores are actually in the area. Uh, yes. Just okay. picking up on that point that Will made about Sika, Sika continue to expand the range they have done for the last 50 or so years. Um, I think the, the issue for us is, well, so what? In the fact that they're here, they're here to stay, they're well established, they are naturalised. Indeed, we know that some parts of the country um, they are actively managed for sport because 
a day's stocking of a Sika stag can attract more money than a day's stocking of a red deer stag because the opportunity is not afforded in other European countries. So you can see there are even tensions in there about the number of Sika when you're pursuing woodland objectives, uh, perhaps neighbouring some of, of the National Forest Estate properties. Uh, they do red inter interbreed with red deer and we know that introgression takes place. I think what you tend to find is that past the first generation they tend to be in deer tend to be uh, either very red-like or very seeker like so physically it's impossible to tell. Um, but we do know that the red deer, the Scottish red deer, is genetically isolated from the rest of the populations around Europe, and as such we have strengthened the protection on the refugia islands on the west coast. Uh, and we're encouraging uh, certainly those parts of the country where Sika haven't managed to establish and where there is collective, uh, I think, um, recognition that, that we don't want Sika to establish, that, that people actively and adaptively kind of focus pioneering stags. And there are certain peninsulas in the, the northwest where they aren't established yet, and, and quite a lot of the owners are keen to see that they don't. That's fine, thanks. John Mill? No, no, no. we didn't. Right, OK. okay. Um, then we should move on to the next question on the current approach. To deer management. Alec Ferguson. Um, thank you, convener. And I, I wonder if we come to the code of practice, which is sort of at the nub of all of much of this debate. Obviously, um, it has been in, in action for only about 18 months following consultation after the passing of the Wayne Bill. Um, and I wonder if I could ask you to comment on how the effectiveness of the code of practice and, and indeed its implementation, how, how is that going to be assessed? Is it too soon to do so? Um, if not, how, how is it actually being assessed? That's probably directed at um, Robbie Cannon, I think. Yeah. Um, so we produced the code, as, as you know, uh, as a result of that duty placed upon us um, following the Wayne Bill. Uh, it does certainly provide, I think, the, the framework to promote appropriate behaviours for all deer managers. I noticed Mike Daniels kind of almost dismissed the code last week as, as a bit of a red herring. I think from our point of view, that code places very firmly a responsibility on all landowners to actively think about how they engage and manage deer, whether that requires collaboration or not. So it's certainly not a red herring from our point of view. Um, I, I take on board the, the fact that it, it doesn't force people to do perhaps what's necessary, but it does set the standard of, of behaviour which we would expect anybody with deer and, and land to kind of uh, as, aspire to. It doesn't prescribe where the balance between the public interest lies, and I think that is perhaps where some of the potential criticism may lie. Um, it doesn't prescribe a more directive approach to conflict resolution, uh, but again, I think we are tasked with, with that to a certain extent. Um, I think that in terms of how well it's been received, there's, there's definitely a greater awareness of the expectations now placed on landowners, uh, a recognition of, of that responsibility. Um, and in many circumstances, that, that responsibility is not a legal one, it's more of a moral and social responsibility when you think about safeguarding deer welfare, when you think about managing deer sustainably as an economic resource and minimising the negative impact on the public interest. Um, I also just reinforce the fact that this is the first time uh, we've actually managed to articulate, perhaps as clearly as we would have liked, what we mean by the public interest. Um, so we've got, as I said earlier, we've got greater expectations being placed on land managers ecosystem service, carbon sequestration. And the code, I think for the first time, uh, we've articulated that, but it is still relatively new, so it's taken some time for, for, for deer managers to kind of get their head around that. We are tasked with monitoring compliance of the code, uh, and I think at the moment all we're really doing is, uh, in doing so is, is where things potentially flare up, whether that's on a designated site or within a DMG where people are struggling to reconcile their differences. The code is the first port of call for us to see, OK, well, how are you behaving in response to this framework which you've set out? Um, we haven't really done an awful lot of thinking about taking a step back and strategically what a review of the code might actually include. I think it will be informed, actually, by how we respond to certain pieces of casework. Thank you. I, I, I mean, can I just confirm that when you're asking that question, how are you behaving, that applies equally to to private land managers and owners as it does to public bodies. Absolutely. I mean, yeah. the, the code is there, it's, it's designed and it's specifically aimed at all land managers where deer may be present. So we were slightly given last week, which I think you've just referred to, which suggested that the code did not really apply to private land managers. That's not the case. The, the code certainly has uh, a little bit more direction um, attributed to public bodies who are expected to follow what's in this code and are, indeed are directed to do so but it's very much been designed to ensure that all managers, all deer managers, 
follow this code. Now, whether they do or not, I, I suspect it just really puts them in, in a greater risk of regulation if they don't. But a lot of that will be dictated to by the actually impacts and, and what has really resulted in our focus in the first place. And how... I mean, we've already heard there are some very effective deer management groups. There are some still in the process of being set up. There are still some even further down the line. How, how do you try to ensure that all of them come up with plans that are regularly monitored, regularly updated, and that adhere to the code of practice? Because without that, uh, there is undoubtedly going to be more regulation. Um, uh, and as one who's keen to avoid regulation wherever possible, how do you try to bring that about? Well, I mean, I think, again, I think it's our job absolutely to ensure that we support the industry as best we can in terms of provision of advice. We have the vision, which is WDNA. We have the code, which is about guiding behaviours. We have best practice guidance, which is about the practical implementation of some of that. Uh, we regularly attend deer management groups as staff to go along and, and try and provide some of that support and guidance and steer as necessary. Um, some of that support is well received. Um, and some of it is, is absolutely necessary. I think, going back to the point I made earlier, certainly for DMGs, uh, the ability for DMGs to have the right infrastructure to be able to respond and adapt and reconcile some of their difficulties is perhaps where we're struggling just now. Um, so, again, I think all we are really doing is responding to uh, issues as and when they arise where the public interest is being significantly compromised uh, and intervening accordingly. But we're not doing it across the country, and I don't think we necessarily need to do it across the country, provided people step up and, and follow some of the behaviours we would expect them to. You think they are beginning to do I mean, we heard from Richard Cook last week that, that you know, deer management groups, and particularly private landowners, are now realising that, that we live in a different environment to the one we lived in 50 years ago. There is a sort of change of opinion slowly happening. Um, you know, how do you react to that? Yeah, I, I think um, my reaction is let's be realistic in the fact that many deer management groups only meet twice a year. So they may have had three meetings since the publication of this code. Uh, I'm not saying that that's, they, they don't need to meet more often than that, but realistically that's how they've, they've currently structured themselves. I think certainly when people are thinking about putting together plans and really getting actively involved in resolving some of these difficulties, they may need, they may need to revisit just how frequently they meet or how they go away and delegate task and finish groups to, to, to meet in between AGMs. But, but realistically, I think the penny has actually dropped uh, that they need to get their house in order. And again, uh, the acceptability of the timescale for doing something is something, you know, we, we touched on it last week. Um, I also just want to echo something Will said earlier on. We are tasked with supporting the system, and I'm sure we can do that better. Uh, we are limited in the resources uh, which we have available to us. Three years ago, when the Deer Commission merged into SNH as a result of public sector reform, um, we specifically uh, and uh, started putting our efforts into other things, not just deer. So I have no doubt that the staff resource and time which is going into deer management groups to provide support has changed. Some of that as a result of the merger, some of that as a result of increasing pressure on public funds. Uh, and I do think we perhaps need to do a little bit more to better support that system. Lloyd Wallace and then John Mill. Thank you. Um, a deer management plan is only any good if it's, if it's used. And, and We've worked very closely with a number of deer management groups in the park, and one in particular, Kengorm Speyside Deer Management Group, have been one of, one of the groups that's been sort of at the forefront of trying to try different methods of deer management planning. And uh, quite a few years ago, six or seven years ago, I think they, they spent, I think it was £13,000 on getting a contractor to help pull together a plan. And it's very detailed. It was, you know, as much information you could ever possibly want. And I, I think largely a, a number of those deer managers in that group were quite happy to admit after after five or six years, it hardly came off the shelf. It, it was, they were, they were pleased they'd gone to the effort of doing it. And, and in many ways, the process of developing the plan is almost as important as the product at the end of it. It's, it's the talking and the thinking about what goes into the plan is obviously very important. But the fact it sat on the shelf was not a good thing, and it was seen as you know maybe money wasted, and um, and that came out of their own pockets, I think. I, I can't remember. Sorry, it may be that SNH helped support it. Um, but latterly to that, they tried to be more pragmatic, and you'll see from our submission, we helped them produce these maps on their their aspirations for deer management, and. Early on in the discussions of that, they were seeing maps as they were talking about their plan as being map based, in fact, and, and something that was dynamic. So, you know, one year you, you might, in fact, the, the, the ownership of estates in the national park has, has been pretty, uh, quite a quick turnover in recent years. And so these maps do need to be dynamic, and a plan that was written five years ago quite soon go out of date. So, 
the maps have been extremely useful in very clearly visually, as you'll see in your papers, representing what it is that each deer manager and each deer management unit, each estate, estate ownership is wanting to see on the ground. And it, as I said in the paper, it's, it's very crude, and we are talking about densities rather than impacts on the ground, and as, as we've already discussed. But it does give an overall impression of what they're wanting to see on the ground, and it therefore opens up that discussion very readily. And you can see quite quickly, quite readily, where there are pressure points. And, and the, the benefit of that is that round the table, everybody knows where those pressure points are in a deer management group, and yet quite often they won't sort of reach the point where they actually get to the nub of the issue and say, what are we going to do about this? And whereas the maps have actually made it very obvious, and, and it has, I, I believe, really helped some of those dialogues and is a very pragmatic approach to deer management planning, which is something quite, as I say, dynamic and, and hopefully useful. So. Milne wants to speak, and then I've got three other people wanting to ask supplementaries. Um, could I just make a, a comment on the code? I, I, my personal view of the code is it's a very anodyne document, and it does, actually doesn't provide really much new information that wasn't there before. It maybe puts it all in one, one place, but it's not actually, I don't think, a very helpful code. And when uh, I originally was involved in, in first discussing the code, it was going to be a much um, sharper and... Um, uh, more detailed document which actually laid out precisely what deer management groups needed to do and it just doesn't do that it's a very you know it's got flow charts and it looks nice but it's, it doesn't actually amount to a row of beans in my view because it it, it 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 really doesn't tackle the issues about conflict resolution which actually Robbie did did mention the other point I'd like to make is that ADMG in their evidence said that you know this was having a big impact and so on and would have a major effect in the future. Well, I've I've lived through living with the the DMGs for or ADMG for the last 15 years, and every four or five years, when they feel there's pressure on from environmental organisations, they they will start to say that. So that I'm really not convinced that that um, the the code will really have much impact. First of all, because it's not a very good document. And secondly, because I, 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 there's, no, there's no clout attached to that document. There's this long-term possibility that SNH might take some action. But I, I, my understanding is that, the, as Robbie indicated, is that the amount of staff actually involved in DEER uh, within SNH has dropped by roughly probably a third compared to, to um, what it was with DCS. Now, how is it managing going to, to be able to do all the things it does, um, really to, to have any impact at all? And again, the point I make is, is, is that particularly in, in uh, non-designated sites, uh, they'll be the last to receive any attention. And just before we go on, if there's anybody who's got a mobile phone or a other device switched on, it should be switched off, especially people in uh, the gallery who may not have heard this. Thank you. Um, Alec Ferguson finished with that line of questions? or? Um, I, I will be coming back to sort of openness and access accountability later, so I'm happy to leave that to later. We've got three Continue. people who want to ask supplementaries in this. Angus MacDonald, Graham Day and Nigel Don. Yeah, thanks, Convener. Um, given that the issue of uh, regulation and the Code of Practice has, has been mentioned um, at this point, uh, and taking on board uh, Robbie Kernan's point that uh, deer management groups have to get their house in order, uh, end quote, um, given that we've heard of, of problems with steer management groups implementing their own plans, and we've heard evidence last week uh, that it could take up to 10 years, between 5 to 10 years, to have all deer management plans in place, is there not an argument for a licensing regime uh, which would help to concentrate the minds of those who uh, have failed to date to come up with a deer management plan or indeed have failed to follow uh, their own plans um, which are already in place? I just thought I'd throw that in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure whether it's a stone or a hand grenade. Um, <laughs> uh, and John? More precisely, what you mean by licensing arrangement? Well, a, a licensing perhaps of each estate, and if they're not conforming to their own um, deer management plan, then perhaps the licence should be revoked. Do what, though? So you, they, they don't actually own shooting. the deer, they, they can only shoot them if they're on their land. They would, and you can't remove that, that right, as I understand it. Okay. Would it not be possible to remove that right if the uh, 
status of deer were changed from being nobody's property to communal property? Absolutely, and that's one option uh, that needs that should be considered. If if the voluntary system doesn't work or a duty is not placed on it to make it work, then the, I think the only route forward is actually to change the definition of of of, of deer. Robbie Kernan. I think um, just having come not all that long ago from the discussion about an opportunity to review the deer legislation. I think it would be only fair for SNH to say that I think we do believe the, legis the, the current legislation can provide the basis for a modern approach to the management of Scotland's wild deer. But the challenge is actually for us, for SNH, to make sure that when we implement it, we do so in a way which is balanced and proportionate to the public interest. We've got a balance between standards, incentives, statutory stroke regulatory solutions. Uh, and we're obviously keen to get that blend right, uh, and in doing so, be clear about where the balance of cost resides. I think I would be slightly nervous that the, a highly regulated system may well cost the taxpayer more money than the current system does. Yes, well, just just a quick point on that. I mean, one, one issue with that whole idea would be how how would you actually judge whether an estate or a deer manager is is conforming and is achieving. You know, it sounds on paper quite simple. They're either they are either are achieving what they should be or they shouldn't be. But actually, in in practice, no doubt that would lead to legal disputes and who knows what. So I could I can imagine it would get quite difficult to 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 gauge that. It's hard enough at the moment proving whether or not a site is in favourable condition or not, and in order to to put in place Section Seven agreements and such like. So I can imagine this having similar trials. Remedy. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, Dr Milne, I think, in written evidence, uh, suggested that no advisory panels have been deployed since the introduction of the Wayne Act. If that's the case, why is it the case? Because wouldn't these be a good means of mediating disputes and perhaps providing direction on balance, uh, balancing conflicting uh, objectives? Yeah, uh, I mean, we have had the... Uh, ability to appoint panels since uh, 96 and indeed we have done so uh, in a number of circumstances uh, certainly pre-merger to try and uh, pull together relevant expertise involving Transport Scotland, uh, local community councils, local deer managers specifically looking at the issue of road traffic accidents um, I think uh, which uh, and all three of those panels were hugely helpful uh, in putting together a, a package of advice to the deer commission at the time in dealing with specific circumstances such as uh, how best to raise driver awareness, manage roadside vegetation, uh, think about driver speed and how we monitor that, <coughs> as well as uh, influencing deer management prescription per se. But uh, ultimately, all those panels are really tasked with doing is providing additional advice to SNH. Uh, again, I think in our submissions at the time uh, for legislative change, we were perhaps looking for those panels to have a little bit more substance about them. So rather than just providing advice to SNH, that we might actually have had some powers for them to, to put together a plan and, and, and for that plan to be implemented. So I don't doubt that in certain circumstances we can and perhaps should think about additional support, uh, facilitation, mediation for some of these difficult land use interests, not just in the uplands but for a variety of situations. Um, we, just, we, ha we have used facilitation uh, by bringing in consultants and mediating between landowners and ourselves to, to reach a, a solution. Uh, which may have resulted in Section 7. We haven't formally used uh, panels under Section 4 of the Act for three years, um, but there's no reason why we can't, and I suspect we may need to do that where we're still finding some of these intractable situations uh, and that SNH is not seen as sufficiently independent to try and uh, negotiate a solution. Don? Uh, I'd just like to pick up what uh, I heard William Boyd uh, Wallace say about maps. I have... I, I never... It uh, ceased to be amazed that people discover maps at some point in life. It seems to me anything to do with the land should always be mapped. At that point, you can quite literally see what you're doing. I've got that map that you referred to in very, very small scale here, and I don't really want to pick up the detail of it. But just looking at it, I find myself thinking there are some aspirations for very high densities and some aspirations for very low densities which are right next door to each other. Now, clearly there may be some significant physical features, uh, and that's not entirely obvious to me, but there are places where they plainly aren't. Uh, and I am conscious that deer can swim, so rivers aren't that much of an obstruction. 
Would it be fair to say that someone selling an estate, and this does apparently happen, um, ought to be telling a prospective purchaser the kind of de-identity that's around so that they don't come on with an aspiration to clear it for some other purpose, but actually recognise that that's the nature of de-identity in their area? Uh, I thought you were going to go in a completely different direction with that question. <laughs> um, well, I, um, yeah, there's all sorts of implications for that. And I, I think the more public these things become about the need for, for balancing deer management objectives, the better. I think, I think someone by purchasing an estate should be well aware of what they're getting into. And obviously, some recent purchases in the National Park, they, they are very well of that, and they've embraced what, they, what they're getting into. Um, so I, I, I would say it's, it's also incumbent upon the purchaser to, to be aware of what they're taking on. So... Whether there's an obligation on the seller to, to make these things known, I, I don't know whether I can comment on Forgive that. Forgive me, I'm not really looking for the legal buyer-seller issue on here, but I mean, more a matter of surely if we are trying to manage deer across the whole of Scotland, then the kind of deer area in which that property lies is something which ought to be a matter of absolute public interest, public knowledge, and which we should, we should be recognising. I mean, the, the southern area of, of the Kingdoms National Park is plainly a high-density area. It, it, it does seem fairly reasonable to say, well, it might stay that way, please. Doesn't it? I mean, isn't that the kind of thing we should actually be saying at a well, appropriate the, the, level? The map reflects what the individual owners are, are wanting, and, and in terms of uh, meeting natural heritage uh, obligations, that, that map doesn't necessarily reflect that. So when you say what, what we want, say what we want in the National Park, um, that map clearly represents what the owners are wanting and isn't, isn't necessarily fitting with what the wider public interest is requiring, I would say. So. Okay, well, that then pushes me, forgive me, Camilla, but where I think we need to go, it, it's not going to happen overnight, but should we be looking, could we be looking at some kind of articulation of the public interest in such a way that landowners, perhaps over a generation actually get to the point where deer are managed across Scotland in a way which is rational for all, rather than constantly living with these disparate aspirations, which must, at the end of the day, be unreconcilable. I think I, think I said earlier on that the issue is where you have the extremes, and as you've highlighted, it's, it's, it's not where you've got moderate levels, you've got very high levels against very low levels, and that, and that is where the pinch points occur and where they're probably the reason why we're around this table. Um, I, th I think, you know, in our submission, we talked a, a bit about the need for support for deer managers, and I think that's the approach we need to be taking because uh, the, deer, the deer debate is quite antagonistic between disparate groups, and I think what we're looking for is a, is a positive approach to helping deer managers. And the, the, the issue, why, why does a, one estate want very high numbers? Well, obviously, they're looking for a sporting cull, but in some situations, I, I do believe there are, there are cases where... The numbers of deer they have on the ground is is above and beyond what they might necessarily need for a sporting cull, and but why do they want to keep them at that level? Well, partly I think it's a defence against what's maybe going on in their, their neighbouring land. It might partly be a resource issue on their point of view because it's 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 a very difficult job, especially in very remote country where you may have to drag deer uh, several kilometres to get them off the hill. I mean, it, we can talk very uh, academically about these things, but actually being out there in the wind and the rain in the winter culling hundreds of hinds is a very difficult job. So when I talk about support for deer managers, we're, we're, lo we're talking about management planning, that kind of aspect, but I'd be looking for uh, deer managers getting more support on the ground. We want more men and women on the hill culling deer. And, and I think, you know, that, that, is, that is the nub of this issue. We, we, we hear about the worry about jobs versus trees, but I actually think in reality we're not an increased cull in some of those areas would not result in reduced jobs. It would actually result in more jobs. So, sorry, I've, I've gone off on one there. <laughs> That's where I was inviting you to go, thank you. <laughs> Very much, Simon Hodge. Just to um, add a thought to this, um, I think this notion of support is important. One of the things that uh, does seem to make sense that all landowners understand what the implications of the code are on their land management responsibilities and duties and uh, one of the areas that I suppose is, is, is possibly relatively poorly understood is what the code says about managing grazing levels to uh, prevent damage to wider biodiversity and to ecosystems and the environment and I do feel that there is 
maybe uh, further to go in, in, in unpacking what, is, what does that look like? What does that mean if, if you have a, uh, if you're contemplating um, purchasing an estate or if you're an owner of an estate, what, what, what does success look like in those terms? And uh, certainly in my experience, I don't think that's necessarily very uh, clearly understood or articulated and certainly uh, an area where there would be very different perceptions of what protecting and, and maintaining biodiversity environment looks like in different contexts. So I think links maybe with the, the notion of support needed, because that's not something that uh, many landowners would necessarily uh, understand or, or, or have a, an accurate ecological view on. And, and we do need to, to help land managers gain a common understanding of what success looks like in relation to that part of the code. OK, um, I think we move on to... Uh uh, section 7s and so on. Um, Dick Lyle. Thank you, convener, and good morning, uh, gentlemen. <clears throat> As the convener said, we turn to the Section 7 control agreements. But I've been interested in listening actually intently in, uh, to some of the tensions within the deer management groups, which actually this is the current system of management of red deer when there's no involvement in Section 7 agreements. If I can turn to the, your written evidence, uh, Dr Milne, you actually said that in 2010, 10 Section 7 volunteer agreements were in place which covered over 50 estates in an area of 273,000 hectares. Since then, no Section 7 agreements have been signed, which is surprising. But this morning, Robbie Kernan actually, if I am wrong, correct me, said that actually you have signed a, a Section 7 agreement recently. Maybe I, I picked you up wrongly. Um, but of those ten, I, I believe five actually, uh, surprisingly enough, are in the convener's uh, constituency. Um, of the, to everyone, uh, of the control agreements um, in place, currently in place, are we suggesting they're not worth the paper they're written on? Uh, or are they achieving their objectives? And are the sites where deer are known to be damaged in natural heritage, which are not covered by these control agreements, uh, if so, where? And are there plans for any more control agreements? Well, I, I could start off since I wrote it. Um, my, uh, well, when the Deer Commission finished in 2010, I think we, we had nine in place and there was one about to be signed. Uh, and I, I, as far as I'm aware, none have been signed since then. Now, I don't know what the, the, all the reasons for that are, but we had to work very, very hard to get those agreements in place. And I think those agreements have been uh, very successful because they've actually they've focused the minds of, of land managers on, on what they've got to achieve. And because those uh, Section 7 agreements are usually chaired by, well, used to be chaired by a dear commission, uh, commissioner, uh, but usually chaired by some senior person, um, they actually do, do work. And... and I think an example, good example of that is, in fact, that two have already been signed off because they've, they've, they've completed their job, they, they, they've done their job. Others have, have been extended, but if you take the Kinlochan example, which was a section different, which, which I actually chaired, um, we got the density half of deer, and uh, down to the level we thought, almost to the level anyway, we thought that we'd, we'd having an impact on the vegetation. Um, We've now another agreement has been entered into because, in fact, the you know we think that we need to go even lower to get changes in the vegetation. But those are very positive processes. So I don't think that you should get the idea that Section Sevens are not a are not a good idea. They are, and if you work hard at them, uh, you can make them work. Um, but uh, I, I, so that's my that's my comments on Section Sevens. Yeah, just just to clarify, um, most of the. Section 7's agreement, most of the Section 7 agreements which you have in place is now, of which there are nine signed, only one of those has been signed post-merger, and that relates to Mar Lodge, which the negotiations actually started before we became part of SNH. I think I would absolutely echo John's point, is that we know Section 7 control agreements can provide a very productive framework to deal with difficult problems. They are generally quite positive uh, in their nature. Not, not easy, because it does require quite a lot of... Uh, difficult and courageous conversations to take place, but they're, they're taking place in a, frame, in a forum which is, is largely productive. Um, but they can be quite resource hungry. Um, as John said, it does take up quite a lot of staff time. Uh, it does take up quite a lot of uh, financial cost to, to make sure we're moving forward on an evidence base which everybody's happy with. Um, and the only other thing I would say is that we know they can work. 
Um, we've shot 20,000 deer in Kinlochen over 10 years, which has taken the population down from where it was to, to where it is today. Benjerig, which has 26 owners attached to it, has taken the population down from 13,000 to 8,000 deer. So we know they can deliver very difficult um, and yet successful outcomes. Uh, but as I say, it, it does take up quite a lot of staff time, which is, I, mean, I suspect we will need to continue to sign more agreements as we move forward as new sites come to bear. Indeed, uh, in the last six months, um, we've written of our desire to, and notified owners of our desire to sign two, two further agreements, um, and we're hopefully going to conclude those before Christmas. Have a public idea of where they are? Uh, one of them is actually is, uh, is the Kinlochan agreement has just come to, to an end. It's, it, was, it was 10 years in, in, in being, uh, and it, 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 it ceased to exist in 2013, so we're renegotiating that agreement, which, to a certain extent, um, is frustrating on one hand that we've managed to secure so much. We've got a population down now to a level which should be manageable for the estates, but uh, I think we're quite keen to make sure that we don't uh, lose any of that momentum which we've managed to secure. So we're going to enter into agreement over the next five years or so just to make sure that estates continue to, to keep numbers down to a level which they need to in order to make sure that progress is sustained. And the second one relates to Ardvar, um, where we've got um, Ardvar Estate, a sporting estate, um, Cunyag Estate, which is owned by the John Muir Trust, and the North um, Ascent Trust, which is community-owned. Uh, we. Six months ago, we, we wrote of our desire to secure a new agreement there, um, and that negotiation has been particularly difficult, as you might expect, because quite a lot of the difficulty there relies on whether or not we decide to put up a fence or not. Okay, well, Boyd Wallace. Okay. Yeah, in the National Park, our experiences of a number of, uh, of Section 7 agreements, and they, they have proved very worthwhile in, in sort of bringing the issues to a head. And, um, definitely we've seen good results as a result of it, as some of them have been mentioned. But one comment I might make is um, certainly early on in, in, in one of the Section 7s that I was witnessing to or went along as an observer to some of the meetings early on, um, a lot of the pressure, understandably, was on the landowner in question who owned the land which was needing better protection uh, and their control of the deer. And obviously you'd expect that pressure would be on the owner of the land that has the designated habitat. Um, and I think, to an extent, this is just a personal observation, the, some of the pressures from out with the area where deer were coming from uh, were less uh, engaged in the process and I think could possibly have helped uh, more effect. We would have got better, quicker results had neighbouring landowners been better engaged in uh, seeing what part they could play in helping to bring that habitat into more favourable condition. It's just an observation. No, and then in the last session, if, if I make it, in the last sessions that we've sat and spoke about deer, um, we've had varying numbers. People say there's 150,000. People say there's 400,000. We've had uh, Nigel Dawn's excellent formula. We've had all the, the situation of people saying, no, we don't need to call them. Uh, I am on record of, of uh, being against the massive call. Uh, of, of, of deer, but how do we manage this? We have the concerns of stalkers. You know, and I, I take the point that uh, um, you know, uh, if, if there were more business, and I made the comment last week about more selling of venison. Uh, I actually checked my local butcher this week; he doesn't sell it. Um, but I think there's an opportunity to improve, to bring jobs to the area, but manage this so. We've got four experts sitting in front of us. How do we manage this that we reach out and, and address the concerns that people have about the environment, but also address the, people, the, the concerns that they have about their jobs and also the area? And how do we get people, because deer do go from one part to, they do migrate, as, as Nigel Dawn said earlier, uh, into areas. And this is maybe where the tensions are between the states and people and and, and all the different areas. So how do we manage this to get basically what I would suggest a good outcome for the people in the area, for the deer stalkers, for the deer themselves, for the estates, for Scotland? How do we manage this? Sorry, I went. Without, without a, um, answering as a thesis <laughs> and a sentence or two. 
Who's going to answer? Oh, yeah, you would. Um, very quickly, I mean, the, the, the route that has been chosen is the deer management group system. Well, uh, let's, let's, all, all I'm saying is that if, you want, if you're going to manage deer uh, in Scotland, you have to do it at a local level, and at the moment that that system is the deer management crew system, I believe it doesn't work sufficiently well because it doesn't take into account the public interest enough, and that's why DCS put forward the idea of a duty um, which would actually help that process. It would help that process in, in also in areas where uh, we don't have, currently um, have uh, designated sites. Because they're protected or they're managed in a, in a better way, in my view. So that that's a simple answer. And if, if that doesn't work, and if you can't get a duty in place, then I think you have to change the definition of deer. Uh, with the greatest respect, before you come back in, uh, I think Angus McDonald made a, a very good point, Erling. Licensing. Now I'm against um, you know putting a, a five thousand pound license or whatever, but a license that that you can carry out your business. If you don't work together with each other. And yes, it will be hard to prove. If you don't work together, we take your licence away. That maybe is a threat. The, the, the thing. I don't want a, a figure put on a licence. I don't want a, you know, uh, some councils of actually uh, charging people li you know, figures, exorbitant prices. I don't want a, a poundage put on it. I, I just want a, a licence. I don't think that, will, uh, that would work, as I've explained before. I mean, when we, when we were actually looking at different uh, mechanisms where we could, we actually looked at the Salmon Fishes Board system, which is another way of looking at it, and we decided that just wouldn't work either. And so, uh, you know, unless you change the definition of deer, we believe, I believe personally, and, and the deer, deer Commission Board believed at the time, that um, the best way forward would be to actually put a duty on, on landowners and deer management groups, because it, you have to think of deer being managed in a collaborative way, and the current system is, is one that, that potentially can allow that to happen, but needs more teeth than it, than it currently has. I'd like to take on uh, the next question from Graham Day. Uh, thank you, Convener. My layman's understanding is that the consequences of a large-scale deer call can be quite severe and long-term with the surviving beasts spooked and therefore considerably more difficult to stalk with all the potential economic challenges that would present. If that is the case, why would some estates run the risk of the imposition of a Section 8? Or is it that they don't believe such measures will ever be deployed, given they haven't been up until now, or that they could readily mount a successful legal challenge to such a move? Um. I think my starting point for all of this and, and picking up on Richard's point is that at the moment the current system allows, allows for a blend of incentive, advice and regulation. Uh, that is the, the system we have in Scotland, uh, effectively trying to define what safe ground might look like for people, otherwise you're going to come and get hit by a big stick. Uh, we are committed to making that voluntary system work. And I think our experience of using Section 7 control agreements demonstrate that we can secure environmental gains whilst balancing those other land use interests and taking others with us in that process. But where we can't, and I think those circumstances are relatively few and far between, where, we, where we've exhausted all other alternatives and we're confident in the powers available to us, um, the implementation of Section 8 is actually much easier post wane than it was because um, there is an improved link between the voluntary and compulsory process with a, a less clunky appeals process we're talking about, we're not going to result in public inquiry if, if, we're, if we're challenged. But the reality is we've only actively considered Section 8, I'm talking relatively recently, on one site, and that was on Kinlochen, where, where the estates weren't delivering their culls as required. Um, the DCS board at that time were asked to consider implementing Section 8 um, if, the, if the estates didn't deliver their cull, which they subsequently did. And I think there's a story there in itself, is that we can make the voluntary system work. Um, and often the threat of using that compulsory and credible backstop is incentive enough um, to make the voluntary system deliver. I think on that point, we are comfortable that we can use Section 8 if we fail to reach agreement, uh, or that we consider an, an agreement to be failing. The ecological evidence base is the same. The only, we need to be clear that damage is occurring as a result of deer. The only real risks that change in all of that are, are, are reputational and political risks. The, 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 the risk um, on the ground or the evidence base is, is no different. Um, 
And again, I mentioned in, uh, earlier on, in only in the last six months, we've notified our desire to secure two new voluntary agreements. It may well be on one of those that we fail to reach agreement. Uh, and it may well be that we come back and ask Paul Wheelhouse to, to sanction the use of Section 8 for the very first time. And that would send a very strong message to a, an environmental NGO, to a private sporting estate and a community-owned estate that if you can't make the voluntary system work, then government is willing to step in and find that best blend. John Noel? Just a, a quick comment that the voluntary system can be made to work on, uh, with Section 7 agreements, which are related to designated sites. Uh, it doesn't deal with all the other uh, areas of Scotland and all the other deer management groups. Fine. Uh, that's okay on that one. We move on to uh, Claire Baker. Um, thank you, Convener. Um, we've covered a very wide range of areas um, this morning, so the question um, that I was assigned to um, answer, I think, uh, to question has already been answered. I'd like to just make then a few observations on the discussion we've had this morning. I think, um, you know, I'm hearing uh, some concerns around the impact of the merger, the Deer Commission going into SNH and the stretch and resources around there. Um, I've heard, you know, SNH talk about that it's more common for conflicts to arise, that there are tensions. I think um, Will Boyd Wallace used the words of there can be extremes within the way in which different estates manage next to each other. And looking at um, John Milne's submission, and as John has said this morning, you know, it might be needed to look at a duty to make sure that the, where the, it's clear where the responsibility lies. And uh, it's also to see that this happens within a wider, you know, why is the committee giving it this level of scrutiny? It's because it's happening within a wider debate around uh, climate change targets, and we know how challenging it is for government to deliver on them, the biodiversity targets. The Parliament's also engaged in a debate around land reform, and uh, how do you make sure land works best in the public interest? Um, so I think, that's, I think that's why the committee is looking at this in such detail. And John Milne has been quite clear on the need for um, a duty. Do other members on the committee see where... Because at the moment it's working on a, on a voluntary basis. Um, now, we've had... Robbie Kernan has said that uh, you think there is still um, opportunities for the voluntary basis to deliver everything we need it to deliver. Um, are the committee convinced that where we are at the moment is where we need to be and there's still more time needed to bed in or thinking about the bigger challenges we, we are trying to achieve and the part that deer management plays in that do we have a robust enough system in place to get us to where we need to be within the time scales that we need to be Can I make just one comment yes. about climate change because we haven't actually talked about it that was a good point to raise I mean I, I do, do think that, that um, there are big issues ahead of us if we're going to actually achieve the Scottish Government targets if we're going to increase, in, achieve the increasing amount of woodland we're going to, uh, we're going to need or to achieve those targets, then I mean, there's going to be much, much more pressure on, on deer management than there's been in the past, because otherwise we'll just not get those trees and we'll waste a lot of money trying to get them. And therefore, I think, you know, we've got a, you're, although the legislation has just been changed, I think an opportunity was missed. And I think the, the, the role of, of deer in relation to climate change is so key uh, that you know something needs to be done about it because in 10, 20 years' time we'll be we'll be regretting not having done something about it. Well, okay. Um, well, there's obviously very very significant public interest in the whole the whole deer debate, and there's very significant public interest in how deer are managed. And I think as a result, then yes, deer managers have a very very firm responsibility to manage deer in a way that is in harmony with public interest and many of them are and I think there are cases where um, they may not be and I think there does need to be some form of um, pressure or whatever how onto them to ensure that the way they're managing their deer is uh, in the long term a benefit to the the habitats and in the long term sustainability of the deer themselves and uh, I can see the convener looking at our deer framework there. I mean, the, the essence of that deer framework for the National Park is all about the long-term uh, benefits of having deer in the National Park and the long-term uh, sustaining the habitats. I mean, fundamentally, the, the beauty of the National Park, the reason people go to the National Park and want to live in the National Park is because of the way it's been managed to date by the, the land managers and the, the deer managers. But it's to sustain that into the future, we have to make sure those habitats aren't degrading. And the, there are cases where, um, as have been identified, and the, there are improvements in place definitely where, where habitats are recovering, but there are places where habitats are continuing to suffer. 
And in those instances, uh, there does need to be some form of duty placed on, on the deer managers to try and um, up their game, so to speak. And we're not talking about mass culls or extermination of deer by any means. We're talking about bringing the deer numbers into harmony across the park. And we've said very clearly in our submission, there's room in the national park, and I'm just talking about the park, uh, for a wide variety of, of deer densities and a wide variety of objectives. And you, you can sustain that, we believe, in the park. Um, but what we need to try and avoid are these extremes, as, as I think you highlighted, um, where you've got you know, very, very high numbers against very low numbers. And you legitimately have to have very low numbers if you want to achieve habitat regeneration. I don't think you legitimately have to have extremely high numbers of deer in order to sustain a sporting cull. So that's, that's the nub of the issue, I think. At the moment, it is um, a voluntary framework. And while um, Robbie Kernahan did talk about Section 8 as being um, an effective backstop, but I think the committee had evidence last week that, that, that it had never really been tested and people felt there, that it wasn't enough in order to... I mean, how do you respond to, to those kind of concerns about a voluntary framework? Um, I, I think I agree with actually everything you've said and the fact that we, we know our resources are under a bit of pressure. We know that some of the conflicting land management uh, issues are not going to go away. If anything, they're perhaps going to increase. Um, the question of not whether or not we need legislative change to, to be able to address that, I think, is, is, is pretty crucial. I think our position is that uh, we believe that the, the current legislative framework provides sufficient incentive uh, and credibility for us, but we need to be able to resource it, and we need to have, I suppose, quite a strong political steer that there is appetite for us to use that regulatory framework as and when we feel we need to. And in, even in exercising it, there are some very difficult decisions about how we best balance ecological outcomes with some of the social and economic issues, which, if I'm honest, we perhaps don't understand as well as we would like and able to, to balance uh, across those three pillars of sustainability. Simon Hughes. Hodge. can't comment um, on the question about um, more statutory regulation, that would be something for my minister to, to comment on. But certainly two points that I'd like to make. One is um, I think it would be uh, very beneficial to have a greater clarity of expectation on land managers. And we talked already about the code. Uh, the, 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 that it, you know, the code is, is, is says all, all, all that it needs to say. It's a good code, but it doesn't necessarily... It needs to be unpacked. Land managers, I think, would benefit from a, a much more precise expectation as to what the requirements are, what, it, what, what achieving that code looks like. The other comment I would make is uh, we've been working very hard um, uh, from a land management point of view, from a forestry point of view, working with uh, deer management groups to try and create a more collaborative environment trying to build trust, trying to build relationships, trying to build the mutual understanding, these six points uh, that the ADMG uh, has laid out. And certainly, you know, for me, I think that's an absolutely key uh, process to keep moving forward and, and uh, would like to see the right environment that allows that collaboration, that, that consensus building to continue, because it is, it is starting to bear fruit in our view. Bobby Kernan. Yeah, just one final point uh, uh, on reflection. I think, again, ways of addressing some of the current concerns is that the government strategy for wild deer is due for uh, a review, uh, and indeed we've begun to think about that process in itself. And I think one of the clear outcomes from that process will need to be a clearer steer on the weight which we, I suppose, give to um, particularly recognising the role that ecosystem health plays in, in, in underpinning sustainable economic growth. Uh, because at the moment, that's, I think, one thing that document doesn't do. It, it probably tries to be all things to all men. And if we actually do want to, to be clear about where the priorities are in delivering the best benefit for, for Scotland, then we need to think about how best we prioritise some of that in there. And that's something we can take forward. But again, useful to, to get some feedback from the committee on that point. Sure you will. Um, any further points? Thank you. Um, Alec Ferguson. I think that actually leads us very neatly into what I wanted just to ask about very briefly. We heard some evidence last week, um, quite compelling evidence in some cases, while well, the, the intimidatory factor has already been referred to, but we also heard evidence of the fact that some deer management groups um, are, are not uh, open and accessible in the way that is probably required of most 
institutions these days, this institution in which we're meeting is a typical example um, and has fairly high standards in that regard. I'm a great believer that an increased degree of openness and accessibility by these groups to, to the general public, never mind other stakeholders. I mean, stakeholders already should be involved in them. But uh, a wider access to them could help enormously in building the trust that um, Mr. Hodges has just spoken about and also in, in helping in conflict resolution. Would you agree with that? And if so, how, do, how under a voluntary uh, way forward, how do we achieve that? I would agree very much that being more inclusive is, is very important in that regard, as long as it's, it's genuine. And, uh, and I think where dear management groups have brought in wider interest, um, I think it has been genuine and, and it's been very positive. One, one dear management group I've been involved with, they actually have sort of two levels of engagement. They have a kind of owner's meeting or a dear manager's meeting where they get down to the nitty-gritty of how are we going to achieve this, Carl? Who's going to work here, and et cetera, et cetera. And they also have a meeting where they have wider interest groups. And that might seem like there's a sort of exclusive element and a wider element, but actually my, my perception of that, that particular group is that that actually works reasonably well. Um, so, but I, I, as I say, I think it, it's extremely important that they bring in the wider interest, particularly the local community and any sort of environmental groups that might be in the area. But it has to be genuine. And I think there are times when it's maybe could be seen as a bit of a lip service. But I, I, think, I think people are waking up to this. So. Uh, can I just ask you maybe to expand on, on, on how perhaps the more reluctant dear management groups are, are, can be encouraged to go down this route um, under a voluntary system? Uh, that might be one for Robbie. Sorry, Robbie. But I, 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 I would suggest that the code and, the, and well, ADMG is certainly encouraging that kind of approach. And I think they play a key role in working with dear management groups to, to achieve that. I think ADMG themselves have been under a bit of scrutiny and have been accused of not fully representing the wider interests of all, all dear managers. Um, but I think they've addressed that themselves as well and are, are looking themselves to be a, a, a very broad church of dear managers across the, the country. Um, so I think that hopefully is reflecting further down the scale with dear management groups as well. So I think they have a key role, but I think, I think uh, they're all aware that the code is kind of under scrutiny and how it's working is under scrutiny for sort of a four-year period, isn't it? And uh, uh, I think so many of them will respond to that pressure. So. Yeah, um, <laughs> I mean, I think, as we know, current management planning across the Ready Range, usually led by local DMGs, um, they are predominantly made up of landowners, but not exclusively. And again, I think I would just reflect that out of the 40 DMGs, and I've attended most of them, there is, there is a variety of, of, of forums, some particularly effective, particularly inclusive and quite open, and others not so much. Uh, I think there are things which we can do to think about um, broadening membership or, or ensuring the constitution of DMGs actually... Uh, include reference to other land use interests, uh, including agriculture and forestry, which many of them actually do, but local communities and the natural heritage, if they don't have that expertise, uh, then they can think about how best to bring it, to bring it in. Um, I do think there is also something there about enhancing the support, whether it's financial or through additional personnel from the state, uh, available to DMGs to help develop those integrated plans um, with greater, greater clarity on what the deer management objectives and outcomes should be. Um, Again, on, on the, on, just reflecting on some of my experience, in terms of inclusivity, we've been to lots of DMGs, and there are there are some which it's it's difficult to tar them all with the same brush because we know that Morvern, South West Ross, South Ross, West Sutherland, they do have an open door approach. They are actively seeking as much support as they can get. They do want to engage with local communities. As often as not, actually, some of those local communities may not necessarily be all that interested. Uh, and, and whilst that might not be reflected around this table, because there is a national interest in some of this, locally, unless there's something which is giving them cause for concern, they might not actually have the time. And, and I think that is kind of being borne out from a number of groups. But openness and transparency, I think, is, is becoming a key issue. Uh, and if we have made any progress in the last three years, it's not all that well publicised. It's certainly not easy. Um, I think Maggie Keegan made reference to it last week. She's not been able to source that from anywhere. So unless you're directly involved in these groups, it's quite difficult to see where that progress is or isn't being made. So DMGs have never asked or they've never been asked or probably felt the need to proactively share and publish some of that. But I think that kind of weight of expectation about just demonstrating some of that progress in the, in the public interest is required. And I can't really see anything 
other than the current resource constraints to stop that from happening. You know, that's just about making sure these plans are published in the public domain, the websites are up to date, and there is an opportunity for people to engage in that. Um, but again, I go back to the point of capacity. Quite a lot of DMGs require solid administration and leadership. And again, it seems to be quite difficult for a DMG to, to, to take that leadership that they are showing, Richard Cook is doing a very good job, into identifying key individuals locally that have got the same drive and enthusiasm and time and willingness to bring all of these difficult players to the table uh, and make it work. Sorry. Oh, if I could, I could just add. I'm also involved with fishery boards, and, and they've recently got an obligation to have more public meetings. And, and, I, and a recent experience of that is that I don't think many public, if any, turned up. But I think making it available is really, really important. And I think perhaps an obligation on deer management groups to hold an AGM every year uh, in which anyone can come along and, and sit at the floor and, and say, well, how are you doing this and how are you achieving this? I've, I've got a problem with my roses, whatever it is. They can, they can then respond to that as, as a collective group. Whereas having, having uh, very large numbers of people around a table at a deer management group meeting, which is intended to try and uh, actually manage the deer, I think could, could get quite complicated if you've got too many people. But, but something like an AGM being an obligation on a deer management group, I think, could be a very positive move. So just to wrap that up from my point of view, is that something that might be addressed through the review that you're talking about? Yeah, I'm quite happy to take that forward as part of the action plan. And, and, and in terms of the WDNA, it is reviewed on an annual basis to actually think about what actions we need to put in place to try and deliver the strategy. So there is already a mechanism to do that. But again, not to be too flippant, I think the comparison to district salmon fishery boards, everybody wants more fish. Yeah. There, is a, there is a big difference. Uh, not everybody wants more deer. Right. Point taken, but structurally, I think it was a relevant yeah. issue. To be clear. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Jim Hume. Uh, uh, thanks, Convener. Just uh, regarding the funding of uh, DM, DMGs, uh, at, at the moment, has there been any funding coming through Scottish Rural Development Programme? Uh, and if there isn't, do you think, you know, with the reforms happening, that the, there should be, and would that actually make any real difference to the way DMGs can deliver? Absolutely. I mean, I think, again, I've already touched on the fact that I do believe in order for the voluntary system to work, it needs to be uh, supported uh, sufficiently. Um, there was, uh, in the last SRDP, provision for uh, uh, to draw down funding for managing deer within uplands and peatlands. Uh, and, again, I, I, goes, I suppose culturally looking at that, we didn't receive an awful lot of application. I think £190,000 went out the door through 14 applications. The problem we have is that um, the, the programme couldn't deal with collaborative applications. So it didn't lend itself well to, to dealing with deer management groups, you know, because of the way that money is distributed. And, and for planning on that basis, it, it wasn't all that helpful. I think some of those challenges, certainly for collaborative applications, are, are recognised and hopefully being dealt with. But there was also difficulties in terms of even the way the scheme worked. For example, within Section 7 control agreements, if we needed money to help support some of the management, quite a lot of the capital outlay uh, was up, up front costs, which some states actually couldn't, they couldn't meet. So there are problems with some of the previous incentive schemes. Um, some of that is about culture and about estates actually seeking money from the public purse, which we can take forward. But again, some of that actually relies in, in making sure the scheme is fit for purpose and it and it's, provides the flexibility which we need. What about leader? I mean, leaders may be more appropriate funding for collaborative. Do you know of any history of that? Well, again, I mean, most, most of the, the thinking had been done to try and get it through rural priorities. Uh, but uh, I think, again, what we need to ensure is that there is a mechanism whereby an agent can act on behalf of a collaborative group. I wasn't aware of any of that being done through leader. Uh, but in terms of actually the, the best tool for the job, I think the important thing is we, we have a, a mechanism to, to fund some of this activity, both for planning, reviewing progress and delivering plans. Well, let's turn this right round the other way. Before 1996 or thereabouts, there used to be sporting rates which were paid by landowners for shooting and fishing, which were abolished by the Conservatives in, uh, around about that time. Some of that money, were it available, might be the kind of thing that the public purse could use. But surely there's a duty that needs to encourage land managers to devote more resources uh, to their own management as John Milne suggests in his submission. 
Obviously, I agree with that, that, that <laughs> comment. Um, I mean, I, and why I'm keen on the idea for duty is, is, I mean, it won't affect, I mean, the good deal management groups, it won't, won't be an issue because they'll already be fulfilling uh, all, the, all the things that re are required. What we're dealing with is, is the rest and ensuring that everyone operates in a uniform manner to deliver what is for the Scottish people. And having worked, you know, I was, I, as well as being the chairman for, for seven years, I was vice chairman for six years. So I've had 13 years of experience of trying to make the voluntary system work. And, you know, we've had successes and some failures. But it, it really is, uh, and with the current resources that are available for deal management from government, it's not on, I don't think, that we can make the voluntary system work using the sort of amount of resources that are available from government. And therefore, what we must, uh, what my view is that you know, to transfer those resources to, to the land managers so that they have a duty to actually put some more money into delivering um, this duty seems to me, a, a, you know, quite, I mean, they're getting all the benefits. They get, they've got the right to shoot deer. So why shouldn't they have to pay a little bit more for, for actually uh, managing the deer in an appropriate manner? Anybody else want to comment? Um, I think there's considerable logic in what, what John says, um, particularly in relation to uh, the cost to the public in terms of managing deer and the resources that have gone into um, assisting deer management groups, etc. I think that does mean there is a certain onus on, on, I think, deer managers to share that, that cost. I mean, it, obviously, they have paid for the privilege of owning the land and paid for that privilege quite, you know, in clear ways that, that means that they then have that right. But I think, equally, they, they then have a responsibility that has an impact on, on neighbours and, therefore, and on the public interest. And, therefore, um, I think there is... Um, a strong degree of logic in what John is saying in terms of public duty uh, beholden to deer managers. So. Hey, um, I want to think a little wider about the future of deer management. We've touched on the review that's coming along very soon uh, and, uh, you know, the planned review of uh, Scotland's wild deer, uh, a, a, na a national approach uh, which is coming up. Um, but we'll have to consider alternatives, some of which we've looked at just now. One thing we haven't talked about was um, what happens in other European countries uh, in terms of the management of deer, because we had evidence that showed that the densities of deer are far lower in many other countries than here, uh, where there is a wide deer range. Uh, indeed, it's about 10 times more here than it is, I think, in, in Norway. Uh, if that is the, it's 10 times more dense. If that's the case, um, should we be looking to any examples uh, from other countries and uh, ask ourselves whether they should figure in this review? Can I just make a, a quick comment? The, I mean, we have looked at this before in, in the Deer Commission. Um, uh, one of the big issues in, in other European countries is, is, of course, the way that... Um, who owns the deer, and that, that makes it quite different. Um, so therefore, it's difficult to translate easily uh, from what happens in other European countries to what happens here. And also, um, most other woodland countries have got a much, uh, European countries have got a much higher proportion of woodland, and therefore, you know, the issues are, are slightly different. So I think we have a unique resource, at least in relation to our highlands, which is not found really anywhere else, uh, and, and also because of the way that we, we actually legally... Um, uh, consider deer, and therefore I think I, I don't think that would be necessarily all that useful. Though it might be useful if you were considering changing the way that you thought of deer legally. Robbie Kerner, just picking up on John's point, I mean Scotland is actually quite unique when compared to other European countries. Now, whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing is is up, to, I suppose, to your own your own personal opinion. But we we actually did undertake in 2010 a review of how how other European countries licensed hunting, uh, and and the role of either regional authorities or the state and how some of that process is, is managed. So if it would be helpful to the committee, I can send you that report because I just looked at it a few days ago. So if you would like sight of it, then I can I can happy to send it on. It would be helpful. Is there any particular point out of it that you think in the context of this question we should note now? Well, other than perhaps reflect that, you know, there are perhaps four or five models which you might be able to kind of uh, demonstrate ranging from full state control in terms of who has the rights and responsibilities and how those are subsequently de delegated to individual hunters, 
as opposed to the kind of Scottish model where state control is, is largely absent in terms of, of management of that common resource. So there are, there are kind of opposite ends of the spectrum and a few things in between. Okay. Um, if that's the case, then I'd just like to ask, finally, uh, the point that I made to the other two groups, that uh, this has seemed to take such a long time for us to get a handle on uh, the deer management uh, systems that we require for today's conditions. And yet people have been writing about this for a long while. And John Lister Kay's paper, Ill Fares the Land, in the mid-90s, uh, he talked about the need for a land ethic to require all sporting estate owners to sign up to an absolute minimum of 15%, but ideally much more, of their whole unit dedicated to natural restoration for 25 years. Uh, it would be 20 years next year if some of those ideas from 1994 were actually being uh, applied and that we might be a good deal closer to some of the goals of having a more balanced ecosystem. Uh, do you think that we should learn any lessons from what was said then? Simon Hodge. Um, certainly, uh, looking at from a woodland perspective, we have the UK Woodland Assurance Scheme, um, which is um, the basis for internationally recognised certification of sustainable forestry. And uh, in fact, uncannily, the figure is exactly the same, but the, there is a requirement for a proportion of the land to be managed principally for environment and biodiversity. I think that, that figure is 15%. So it's definitely a, 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 an idea and approach that is well embedded within uh, the notion of sustainable forest management. Cool. Um, yeah, we referred in our submission to the document produced by the, the Cairngorms Partnership, and that was also in 1992, and that was called Common Sense and Sustainability. And it was a report to the Secretary of State for Scotland, and it was uh, it, within that it covered a huge range of issues, a bit like our current national park plan today. But within that, it had a lot in there about the high priority that there was for, for deer management to be um, undertaken to, to restore native habitats and this kind of thing. And I wouldn't say that hasn't happened um, at all, because there's been a hell of a lot of progress in that in the national park in the last. 11 years since that was written. Is it 11? It's 20, 21 years, sorry. So my maths has never been good um, since that was written, but... Um, <laughs> yeah. It's hopeless. Yeah. Um, so there has been a huge amount of progress, but the very fact that we're sitting around this table today, I think, indicates that the issue is still not resolved. And uh, So I think there are lessons to be learned from the past, and we do need to be aware of, of the fact that these things were said 20 years ago. So. And I understand that there was a very negative reaction to that uh, paper, to put not too fine a point on it at that time. Just yes? Clarification. Yeah. Can I, um, maybe, Rob, I'm sorry, I always seem to come to you, but um, are you able to put a figure on just how much land has come under environmental designation in the last 20 years in Scotland? I know um, that we've got 1.5 million hectares of land in the country which is designated, so about 18% of the country is, is under form, some form of formal designation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If there are no further questions, um, I'd like to thank the panel for a hugely uh, useful session just now. Uh, we've got a lot of material to chew on, and uh, we look forward to being able to contribute positively to this debate. Um, I shall shortly ask the public gallery to be cleared and move the meeting into a private session to consider the Scottish Government's draft Scottish Climate Change Adaptation Programme and Behaviour Change and the Agricultural Holdings Scotland Remedial Order. Um, our next meeting, uh, the committee will hold an evidence session with the Minister on Wildlife Crime Report and uh, the committee will also look at a revised draft Scottish Climate Change Adaptation Programme and Behaviour Change letter a petition on managing uh, geese populations and two SSSIs. So with that, I would close this meeting in public and move into private and have a short break.